Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the program. I am your host, Chris George Zuger, and my co-host, Big Sexy Alex. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing this wonderful Friday evening? It is the Den of Lore show. And uh, grab yourselves a glass of scotch, pull your chair up to the fire, because we're going to learn some very cool shit tonight, courtesy of a man I've been trying to get on this show for six months. Uh, Mr. and I'd say brother, John Michael Greer. And we're going to be talking about the Lost Keys of Freemasonry today. Uh, so we are very excited. I have uh, been over the moon over this book, uh, the, which uh, you can find the links in the show notes. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in a second. I don't, we're, you know, I don't even think we're going to have an opening segment today. I think we're just going to kick right into it because normally we start around 8.30, but uh, we're starting a little bit late today. Uh but in the meantime, uh, check us out at Den of Lore on Twitter. Or again, uh, you can talk to me directly uh, in the, the YouTube chat. And, uh, you know, if there's any questions for John, I will try and fit those in as best I can. But most importantly, let us introduce our host or guest with the mostest. Doesn't really rhyme, but we'll try. <laughs> Brother Greer, how are you doing this uh, this evening? I'm, I'm doing very well, thank you. <laughs> it is an absolute... If the, if you, the hostess with the mostest would be probably the guestess with the bestest. The guestess with the bestest. We'll, we'll go with that. There we go. Something like that. <laughs> so, uh, again, I, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us on the program. I know that we've had, uh, you know, some, I'm not going to say issues, but, you know, whether it was a cold or, you know, your schedule was messed up, my schedule was messed up. We just couldn't get it connected. I'm so glad that you were on the program tonight and very proud to have you on the Den of Lore and you are actually our first fellow Freemason that we're interviewing. Okay. So I'm uh, very, very, very cool about that because well, the subject you know, matter. I'm pleased to be on. Oh, thank you very much. Let me just tune the music down a little bit for our listeners and viewers. Now, for the ladies and gentlemen that are listening at home, uh, just to be able to introduce our guest, John Michael Greer is an American author, independent scholar, historian of ideas, cultural critic. He is a neo-Druid leader, uh, hermeticist, environmentalist, conser conservationist, blogger, novelist, and occultist esoterist who currently resides in Cumberland, Maryland, after living in Ashland, Oregon for a number of years. He was raised in a non-religious family, and uh, Brother Greer has uh, graduated from Western Washington University in 1983 and from the University of Washington with a BA in the Comparative History of Ideas. Uh, he was, uh, uh, sorry, I do apologize. Uh, he <clears throat> currently serves as the Grand Archdruid of the Ancient Order of Druids in America, a position he has held since 2002. His first book, Paths of Wisdom, a study of the Golden Dawn system of Kabbalah, was published in 1996. Uh, Brother Greer has since written, edited, and or translated many other books on numerous subjects and topics, including multiple encyclopedias. Uh, and again, the rest of the introduction, I could go on about this because this is the most fascinating uh, introduction that I've done. But all of it's in the show notes. And Brother Greer, without further ado, I'd like to welcome you officially onto the program. Thank you very much for joining us once again. Uh, how has Thank your, you for having me. Uh, how has your evening been going? Um, pretty calm. Pretty pretty calm, all things considered. <laughs> uh, the, the world hasn't ended there south of the border? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, the blood curdling screams, screeches, howls, um, yelps, and, and um, cries of agony have, have, as far as I know, they haven't slowed down much, but no, the world has not ended. <laughs> They're all cleverly muffled by the White House. <laughs> 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 Illuminati confirmed? I think that's Illuminati confirmed. <laughs> Actually, it's the Aluminum Bavariati, the secret society of storm door salesmen. Ah. They're behind it all. <laughs> It, it, uh, they're they're not as treacherous as those uh, you know secret order of Amway salesmen and, and them and their but, but, knives. Oh, you know, you want to be careful of those, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> now, but, for all ahead. the ladies and gentlemen at uh, at home, uh, the reason that we have uh, Brother Greer, and I'm going to be mentioning him, Brother Greer, because I did mention that he is also a Freemason, and mm -hmm. uh, for me, that's uh, you know you got to you, you talk to a brother, you talk you call him brother, so. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, he has a new book out that uh, was released December 8th, 2016. It's available in paperback as well as on Kindle. The link is in the show notes. 
Uh, it is called The Secrets of the Temple, Earth Energies, Sacred Geometry, and the Lost Keys of Freemasonry. And uh, again, get like, you know, the, the uh, when summer solstice is a couple months away, but we've got the equinox coming up uh, for either or fantastic gift for the for those occasions. Get five, get 10 for your friends, uh, get one for your dog. You know, it's <laughs> so uh, tell, tell us a little bit about the book. OK, basically, quite a few years ago, um, in the course of, of my usual oddball reading into all kinds of strange corners of, of mythology and folklore and history and things like that, I started noticing there's a lot of material relating to um, agricultural fertility. Um, customs and practices that make the crops grow better. Of course, the usual the, the usual belief um, these days is that, well, that's all just primitive superstition. And I've always been a little suspicious at that phrase, primitive superstition, because these, quote, primitive, unquote, people who are generally living very close to the, to the natural world and who very often pay much closer attention to it than we do, um, presumably they know what they're talking about from time to time. And so... In the process of just, just following up one lead after another, I noticed that there's this entire strain of ideas that relates to a connection between crop fertility on the one hand and certain kinds of temples on the other. And that just let me scratching my head. I was going, what? And but So I sort of filed it, kept it for for. for future reference. Um, all of this was actually, this, this was back before I became a Freemason in, in 2001 that I first started on the, um, on, the, on the process of digging into this. And then after I was raised a Mason, I was noticing, of course, there's a lot of material in Freemasonry that relates to King Solomon's Temple. And if you go into the, um, into the Talmud, the, the Jewish sacred writings, um, and into the sections of the Talmud that talk about King Solomon's Temple, and there's a lot of material in there. Um, the, the original, the, both the, the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud, the two uh, big volumes of Talmudic collections and commentaries, have enormous amounts of material that was collected from the, from the old temple practices, the old temple people who knew how things were done back before the Romans destroyed the Second Temple. And so here and there through all of this stuff, there's all of these little comments and references to the fact that, you know, the temple and the temple services and all this kind of stuff that was going on at the temple, something in there was improving the agricultural production through a, a at least a significant chunk of the of the land of Israel. And again, this was head scratching material for me. But I kept on digging. And I kept on digging, and I kept on digging. I discovered, among other things, that most cultures, not all, but most cultures that have temples have this idea. That there are certain specific patterns, design elements, um, structural elements, um, materials that are used, various customs, and so on, that are common wherever you have this connection between um, temple architecture and agricultural fertility. And I began, to think, I began to do some serious poking around saying, okay, is there any way that a structure suitably positioned, suitably designed, suitably placed could actually affect how crops grow? And in fact, there is. In fact, there are, there are several known physical phenomena. We're now, I mean, there's, we could get into a long talk about the potential metaphysical dimension of this, but, the, the, but for the moment, I want to talk about actual physical forces, the kind of thing that scientists know about. There are several such forces. And what I, became, what, what I began to see here is that we have scraps, just fragments, of an ancient folk technology, something that was devised by trial and error of probably over many thousands of years, that used certain known physical forces in unfamiliar ways to boost agricultural fertility. And that these, these practices, these customs, and this technology focused around certain kinds of temples, of which the Temple of Solomon is a great example. So that was the seed from which this entire book grew, looking at the Temple of Solomon, looking at the various traditions connected to it, looking at the links to agricultural fertility, and then noticing elements of Freemasonry that tied into it in one way or the other. Now, I've always heard that the uh, uh, the Temple of King Solomon was 
uh, I've heard it from one of one of two things that it's either you know an actual physical building that was built around uh, uh, 1500 BC or so and, and uh, Scotty Roberts when we had him on the show last week had discussed it as an actual physical building I've heard mm-hmm. other individuals who've, who've discussed the uh, the temple as more of a, meta, a, a metaphorical temple that you know was built mm-hmm. within Freemasons based on uh, you mm-hmm. know, based on the memory work and based on the fact that we're just trying to build something that is uh, better within ourselves to be better for others, you know, outside. Mm-hmm. So, how how have you been able to reconcile those two concepts within uh, within this uh, this work? Well, one of the very common things that you'll find with most ancient ways of thinking, and it's something that modern people don't get easily, is that in to the ancient mind, it is almost never either or. It's always both and. So that, for example, when the Temple of Solomon was built as a physical building of stone and cedar beams and things like that, it was understood as a metaphor in stone. It was understood as the physical expression of a symbol, just as, say, the two pillars in a Masonic temple. They they exist. They're solid. You You can tap on them. But they also have symbolic meaning. They also teach us things. In the same way... Uh, the Temple of Solomon, built to you know, built built to for the worship of the of the God of Israel, was a physical place. It exi- you know we know it, we know where it was uh, approximately where on the Temple Mount the original one built, and then the second temple that was built after the Babylonian captivity. And but it was also a focus for ideas. It was it was a symbol. It was a metaphor. It was a huge emblem, a concatenation of emblems that people used at that time, much the same way the Freemasons do now. And so if you, re- if you remember that from the ancient perspective, every physical object is a symbol, every physical object is also a symbolic object, then it stops being, having to try to figure out which one it is, because it's always all of the above. And with, with that uh, type of representation, I know um, for a lot of the times when, when people are dealing with uh, the columns, um, I, like I, I know the the columns can be represented as, uh, let's say the uh, like the, the the pillars of Enoch, and I know that there mm-hmm. are you know the pillars that are sta- that stand outside that the supposedly the supposedly stood outside or inside the temple of King Solomon. Uh, mm-hmm. I've also heard references to how the pillars are represented as, and if I'm not mistaken, this is actually referred to in your book, um, as uh, the, the pillars being represented of the two deacons uh, within mm-hmm. a Masonic lodge, uh, as mm-hmm. the, um, the the initial lines for a building were being laid out based on where the sun was actually rising mm-hmm. on a certain mm-hmm. day, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that one of the biggest symbols that uh, is supposed to be a secret or not really a secret, but people haven't been able to figure out is the Mm -hmm. uh, circle with the the dot in the center and the two lines on either side, which Mm -hmm. you actually basically say, no, it it was represented as, you know, the laying out of the the initial laying out of the temple and it was the two deacons doing it. So that's that's one of the things it is again. Symbols. One, one of the, this. Is, this is really difficult for the modern mind to grasp. That a single, a symbol does not have a single meaning. A symbol has many meanings. So the circle, flanked by the two lines with the dot in the middle, and tip. Um, I don't. I don't know whether you do this um, down here, here, down up your way. Down here, there's a there's an open Bible, usually. No, we have those. Well. Okay. Yeah. Um, so basically, but in the, the, the original versions of it, the, the Bible was a later edition, the original version of it, you've literally got a map of the movement, the movement of the sun over the course of the year. Because remember, the two vertical lines represent St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. That's, okay. that's something that's in... Now, that's part of part of the tradition. Now, one of the biggest things that I know that I hear in a Masonic lodge are people who uh, say, "Okay, well, you know, especially in the Scottish Rite, we hear, okay, the, you know, Saint John the Baptist and Saint John the Evangelist, and mm-hmm. we don't necessarily understand. Some people don't necessarily understand why they're included in the symbolism, besides the fact that they were very learned men, and and you know, uh, mm-hmm. so would you be able to explain the the uh, significance sure. of those two uh, individuals? Sure. Oh yeah. Here again, multiple multiple meanings. The, originally, now back, we're going back to the Middle Ages here, um, when masonry was an operative craft. It was a one guild among many guilds. Of course, there were, every every skilled craft had its own guild, and every guild in the medieval world had its patron had one or two patron saints. And it so happens that the patron saints that were chosen by the Masons Guild were John the Baptist and John the Evangelist. Um, I I used to know like who was the patron saint of shoemakers and so on. They all had them. So you have that. But there's another level of meaning here, too, because St. John Baptist's day 
is the 24th of June. And St. John the Evangelist's Day is the, um, what is it, 20-something of December. It's right, I think it's just a little after Christmas. And so those symbolize the summer and winter solstices. Now, if you, ne- next time you happen to be, um, you happen to spend an entire year getting up before dawn and looking out to the eastern horizon, you'll notice that at different points in the, in the year, the sun rises at a different point on the eastern horizon moving north along the horizon from the winter solstice to the summer solstice, and then back the other way um, as, the, as, the year, as the year moves back toward the winter. Toward winter. Yeah, that would be and hard so, for me because uh, I don't usually get up past, you know, before 7 o'clock. It's got to be well, something very I, important. I, I, <laughs> I, would be, I would be much more like, myself, I'd be much more likely to watch the dawn before going to bed rather than after, you know. But, um, so at any rate, you've got this, this steady circular movement of the sun. This is the kind of thing that, um, for example, the folks who built Stonehenge used to track. The reason that you can, you can use Stonehenge to, to map the year precisely is the sun's rising at different rising and setting of course at different points across Salisbury Plain so you stand there in the center and you look off over the heel stone and on the day of the summer solstice and no other day the sun comes right up over that stone but so in the process of laying laying out churches in the middle ages this is this is a you know something i get to um, later on in the book but it's an important thing people tend to think that churches are laid out facing the east and in the Middle Ages, they were broadly speaking, but east was kind of variable. What happened was they were pointed toward the sunrise on the saint's day of the saint to which the church was dedicated. You know, you've got a you've got a church of the Virgin Mary. Okay, it's going to be um, typically it will be done at the Annunciation, which is I think the 23rd of March, something like that. It's right around the spring equinox. So on that day, up comes the sun. Your master mason and your two deacons are standing there with their poles. They line up the central axis of the church on the sunrise. Mark it out with um, with a skirret. I, do, do you still use the skirret in Canada as one of the Masonic working tools? Yeah, it's a third degree. Yeah, well, there we go. Yeah, okay. It's been dropped by most of the American jurisdictions, but I'm, there are a few of them that still remember it. Yeah, it's basically basically a rope and a peg. Um, and that was what they that was what they did. They'd, they'd have cleared off the site beforehand, cleared off all the, the shrubs and, and um, grass and everything. So they had a large, big sheet of bare earth there. So one, um, your two, your two deacons stand one for one to the east, one to the west. They line up um, so the mouse, so the master is looking right across both their both their wands to the rising sun. The skirt is strung out. That becomes the center line of the of the church. If your church is dedicated to John the Baptist, you're you're um, drawing that initial line on Saint John Baptist's day. If it is um, a church of Michael and all angels, you do it on Michaelmas, and so on and so forth. And how does this relate to the overall temple tradition that's been seen around the world? I, I know Masonic lodges are built one way, and I know that they're very similar to the way that temples were made. Uh, like essentially, it's supposed mm-hmm. to be a representation of King Solomon's temple or a smaller version of it. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, this is something. Isn't this something that's been seen as far as the general themes of construction? Not like not just within Western Europe during the uh, the uh, medieval times, but also uh, like you know, let's say in Eastern religions. Isn't isn't that correct? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It varies from tradition to tradition. Um, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of flexibility and a lot of experimentation that has gone on over, over thousands of years, of course. But generally speaking, um, yes, your te- your, the temples that have this fertility tradition connected, they're aligned to the, to the sunrise. Um, a Hindu temple, for example, a Hindu mandira, is, is laid out very carefully um, facing, fa- facing the east. And they have a they have a relatively they have a relatively complex process that taught that's taught in the Shilpa Shastras, the, the Hindu writings on how you lay out a temple properly. Where you're you know, you, you you're tracking the using the, the movement of the sun um, and some basic geometry and you lay this whole thing out so it's exactly four square to the um, to the four quarters of the heavens. Um, in other traditions it again it varies. Um, your ancient Greek temples, most of them Face the sunrise at some time, some some relevant time of year. The t- typically the time of year when the major festival was being celebrated. Um, some of them have other have other orientations. I don't yet know. I don't think I don't think anybody knows why exactly there are these other orientations in some places. There's a, a lot of research still needs to be done. But that orientation seems to be part of the toolkit, part of what what makes the whole thing work. And I know I know from from discussions that I've had with. Uh... Uh, with Randall Carlson, uh, who, believe it or not, it, a, a lot of the subjects that you talk with in this book, uh, 
kind of coincide with, you know, on one part than what he's discussed as far as the, mm-hmm. the Grail mythos. And he's gone deep mm-hmm. into it if, if you check out... Uh, check out his site. I'm not sure if, you, if, if you've ever met, met Randall, um, but he talks a lot about the, the uh, Grail mythos and how the uh, cathedrals in, uh, in Europe uh, were basically made around the idea that, uh, you know, essentially the buildings themselves were meant to kind of replenish and uh, give sustained growth towards agriculture within the surrounding area to that, uh, you know, to, to that, where that thing, where that temple was built. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, so, that's, well, that, that's, that's exactly the case that I was trying to make. I, I, will, I, have, not, I have not met or met him or read his books, and obviously I'm going to follow up on that. Uh, yeah, like, honestly, like Sacred, Sacred Geometry International, it's, it's a long URL um, or web, mm-hmm. web address. I, like, you know, I, I got to link you get two guys up because I think you, you two would be able to. I, I, think, I think you do. Sacred Geometry is, it, it has been a major interest of mine since the early 1990s. And, you know, so, I, yeah, I think, I think we're going to be talking. He's, he's a brother as well. <laughs> oh, excellent. Okay, yeah. cool. So, it, it, like, f- he, he doesn't necessarily go too, too deep into um, your side of it. For him, it's, it's a, a slightly different direction. But, mm-hmm. you know, combined, it's, it makes kind of a full yeah. story around this uh, right. subject. And that's 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 really fascinating. Oh, I know it's and amazing. The thing, and the thing is, here again, that sort of that ancient, not either or, both and, is very important here. One, very often these days, I've I've seen this happen in a lot of of alternative, alternative science, alternative history, and so on. People get stuck on, well, was it this or was it that? Well, very often it was both, and then several other things as well. Um, you know. Is Freemasonry descended from, um, you know, medieval building guilds, or is it descended from the Knights Templar? Well, both, as far as I can tell. Which I find um, very fascinating, especially considering that with a lot of the builders, uh, and I know that you touched on this with your book, and I'd love to be able to, to, to get your take on it, um, sure. where, you know, there may have been different, uh, different ways that... Um, essentially like how they laid out the initial structures of the mm-hmm. buildings, the foundations, that there were like kind of one or two different systems that sometimes mm-hmm. they didn't mm-hmm. coincide. Um, so oh, there's a, yeah, sometimes, there's a story about that. Sometimes things just emerge as opposed to are created, right? So let's mm-hmm. let let's get your take on on the um, uh, the Grail the, the 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 Grail history and and that mythos as far as recovering the Grail, and let's move on to how that kind of fits into the uh, different systems because like that that is you know very very mm-hmm. fascinating even for me. Okay, so let's start let's start with the Grail, um, I, and I think it's it's important to start in its historical context. We have um, Chrétien de Troyes, the the author of the first known Grail story who was a close associate of, um, of very important crusading knights and things like that. He had, you know, um, he had connections in the, in the, with the Knights Templar. He, had just, he was in the middle of that whole milieu. And all of a sudden, he comes out with this story. And it is not... Um, he, you know, he, claims, he claims that he got it from his patron. I'm actually flipping through the... Um, through the book here to, to remind myself of the relevant name. Available on Amazon. Available on Amazon, that's true. Um, there we go. So... Yeah, so... Um, oh, come on. The book okay, is edit, nicely edit, heavy with I'm, I'm not going to go digging. Since, so, but he, he, had, he, had a patron, he had a He had a noble patron who was a very famous crusader. And... Um, Chrétien said that he got the story of the Grail from a book that this guy lent him. And he wrote out, well, he, he, this, was, this was his last Arthurian. He'd written a whole series of Arthurian stories at that point. This was the last one, and he died before he finished it. But it was the, the uh, 12th century equivalent of a raging bestseller. And all kinds of other people jumped on the same story, and very competing versions started to surface. And the... the during during the the sort of height of the Grail fad, if you want to call it that, there were dozens of different accounts of of the Grail. Some of them skewed toward um, orthodox religious viewpoints. Some of them fairly obviously skewed toward rather unorthodox religious viewpoints. And all of them focusing on the idea that there was this mysterious something called the Grail. Maybe it was a cup. Maybe it was a stone. Maybe it had something to do with Jesus. Maybe it didn't. Um, again, these are among the things that were being batted back and forth. But the thing that it would do, if you found the Grail, if you, if you, if you reached the Grail Castle, and there would be a ceremony in perfect silence, and if at that time you said, what does this mean? 
or whom does the grail serve? Or, um, you know, oh, oh, Fisher King, what, what, what's wrong with you? What ails you? There are various versions of the question, but you have to ask a question. If you ask the question, the, the terrible wasteland, which has been devastated for an age and an age, all of a sudden comes back to life and health. The, 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 trees, the trees put out leaves, crops grow, everything's wonderful again. If you don't, if you don't ask the question, you know, they take you to a bedchamber and then you wake up in the morning and the castle is empty and uh, apparently abandoned and you have to start the quest. Now, it's a marvelous literary gimmick. But there's also, I mean, the, the people in the Middle Ages were not stupid and they were not, they, they didn't just come up with stuff like that. Again, they had that very strong sense that material things are symbols, that stories are symbols. What's being said by the Grail story is there's a question you need to ask, and you're not asking it. The question is, what, are these, what does this mean? What do these things mean? What's going on here? And to a very important extent, we need to do that as Freemasons with the traditions of our order, because there's a lot of stuff that we do that nobody knows why, or that we have typically ethical reasons for doing it okay you know I, I, your typical your typical masonic lectures give give ethical moral precepts for this symbol and that symbol and the other symbol and those are great those are important we can use those to to guide our lives and to 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 help our help ourselves help mature into um more productive more compassionate more effective human beings but again it's not either or it's both and what else might those mean a lot of us don't ask that, and a lot of us need to. Back at the time, my guess is that the, what Chrétien was saying, what the other Grail writers were saying, was you need to be asking this about your religion. There are all of these curious customs that we've inherited from the past. What do they mean? What does this ritual mean? What does this church structure, what does this architectural practice mean? What is it there for? What does it do? And... There again, the Grail tradition is very explicit. Over and over again, there is a secret lore connected to the Grail. And if you follow it, if you, if you do what you have to do, you ask the right question, the, the wasteland blossoms for agricultural fertility and, once again. And I know that there were, there were many different versions. And like, this was during the age of the troubadours as uh, they were kind of marching across Europe and, and spreading, uh, uh, spreading lore and you know, kind of the same ideas we're doing right now in a podcast. So the podcasters of their time. And considering the amount of uh, uh, you know, potential, uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily a free-thinking time or you couldn't go out and say, well, this is what I believe and these are the ideas I have without – you know, kind of running into trouble with, let's say, the church mm -hmm. or local authorities and, or what have you. Uh, uh, so a lot of the times they use symbolism. And exactly. and for a lot of the symbolism I itself, it was, uh, you know, like there, whether it was King Arthur, or whether it was a different king, or, you know, sometimes King Arthur was going out, or maybe it was uh, his uh, second, uh, was it Galahad or King, uh, Lancelot? Lancelot. Yeah, Lancelot, Lancelot was, was going yeah, out. Was and number one night, yeah. And, you know, like, let's say the king died and, you know, the, the grails brought back and, you know, it, the, the, the king all of a sudden uh, was able to re uh, revive himself from that. And mm -hmm. the idea was that was supposed to be metaphor to the land itself, kind of, you know, mm -hmm. being revived. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and since the, the grail stories came out, it's really interesting because when you look at um, central and southern France at this time, right in this period, you have the Grail story starting to take shape, become going public. You have the the Cathars, the Great Albigensian Heresy, um, rising up to challenge the rule of the Catholic Church. Right at the same time, you have the first historical appearance of the Kabbalah, which was um, I believe it was Nar Narbonne, that I, the Rabbi Isaac the Blind and his circle of students first, you know, first um, put together what, you know, the, if you will, the first draft of what we now know as the Kabbalah. So all of this stuff was bubbling together. There was alchemy going on. There was all kinds of esoteric stuff in process in this place and in this time. And the, the reaction was already building. The, the, you know, the, move, the turn toward um, repression that resulted in the Albigensian Crusade, the creation of the Inquisition, and various other unpleasant events of the same kind. Um, that was just starting to pick up as the Grail legend 
burst out into the European imagination and spread all over Europe. And how does this relate to the Knights of the Temple? And okay, it... yeah, the, and the, tem- the Templars were in the th- were in the thick of it. Um, now, the Knights of the Temple, of course, the, the, um, there's there's all kinds of complexities and uncertainties surrounding them. Um, we we we've all heard the, the the official account that you know these nine nine French knights in Jerusalem who'd, who'd been part of the First Crusade bound themselves together as a monastic brotherhood to protect pilgrims on the roads um, leading from the seacoast to Jerusalem. Um, how nine knights were going to do this is a very interesting question. Um, and but they were they were immediately given um, given given a place to. Um, Given rooms in the in the palace, I believe, was the king, of the kings of Jerusalem, and um, what we know about their activities suggests, and there's archaeological evidence for this, in fact, that they did a lot of digging underneath the Temple Mount. There's actually a tunnel that Israeli archaeologists found, and I think it was in 1968, that leads from just outside the Temple Mount, deep up inside it, right toward. Where the where archaeologists think the Holy of Holies of the original temple used to be. Ooh. Now, nobody knows what's on the far side of that uh, tunnel because with the the whole religious and ethnic struggle over Jerusalem these days, the Temple Mount is Muslim sacred space. You can't, you know, and the and the, the council of of um, of Muslim officials who who have control of this will not allow any archaeological work inside the Temple Mount. So there's no way nobody knows where the where the where this tunnel actually leads, but it's there. It's been discovered, and the the, the things that they found in it, the sort of uh, the tool marks and the kind the kind of wreckage and stuff, made it very clear that the people who who made the tunnel um, were uh, in the period of the Crusader states, during which time the Temple Mount, during almost all of which time the Temple Mount was was Knight Templar territory. And okay. that being that long ago, uh, uh-huh. you know, I, I know some of our listeners, uh, especially in the the younger demographic, may, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they'll think that okay, well, you know, the the Knights Templar and and uh, they'll go on to the Dan Brown, uh, tr- you know, the the Dan Brown uh, <laughs> rabbit hole, as it were, and okay, mm-hmm. well, you know, like the the Holy Grail being Sangreal, and and it's you know the the blood of Jesus Christ, and you've got the Mary Magdalene thing, and uh, I I don't oh, necessarily. Boy, I know. Well, like Dan Brown is like he's 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 the McDonald's of authors. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not I'm not disrespecting him in any way, but his books are he or I should say he's the James Cameron of 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 authors. Where mm-hmm. that particular book was equivalent of like Avatar, where it's like mm-hmm. you know you know it's very similar to other stories and it's just good enough. You're gonna li- you're you're going to uh, you know enjoy it, but it's not really it's not really going to give you much in terms of deep thought. It's just going to be entertaining and throw oh. enough. Ideas at and, you. And th- 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 there's there's another little problem there. Um, you know that he got most of his ideas from um, the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Yes. Okay. Uh, which, which I ha- which I have I, th- I believe I've read it. I'm I, I'm I'm delighted to hear this. Um, Holy Blood, Holy Grail is kind of a fascinating story because um, what what happened there? There was a there was a Frenchman named Pierre Plantard. And he was he was kind of a minor player in the French occult scene um, during and after the Second World War. And I, I don't know if you've dealt with um, old-fashioned occult orders, but it used to be very common for them to come up with really colorful lineages, which they invented, typically out of whole cloth. And you have these long lists of grand masters going back to some, some probably distant time in the past. And you'd have these grandiose claims about all this important stuff that they did. When you're talking about an organization that has maybe you know three dozen members and has to pass the hat to pay rent for its um, you know its monthly meetings, um, that that was standard back in the day. You could find it uh, among among some of the occult orders that are still run, the traditional occult orders still running around. Although I'm I'm glad to say a certain number of them has started backing out and saying, "Come on, the illustrious panhandlers." Them. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. Um, and but Pierre Pierre Plantard was really good at coming at cooking up this this very ornate um, background for his his secret society that he invented and ran. He invented in the 1950s and backdated it to the dawn of time, back to the Merovingian kings of France. And he also did did something that I think is unique in the history of of occult historical forgery. If you go into the sort of really high-quality 
top end libraries in France where they have all kinds of ancient documents, okay? They take incredible care to make sure you don't take anything out. But until recently they didn't take they weren't sufficiently careful about whether you brought anything in. Oh. And so a, a whole range of, do- of, of nicely forged documents were cooked up, and then Plantard and one of his friends walked them into places like the Bibliothèque Nationale and so on, and slipped them into, um, you know, collections of documents, and then found them. You understand? Oh, look at this! Did you know? Did you know this was in here? And there it is. You know. It was great. Now, the organization that um, Pierre Plantard invented, his, that he founded in the 1950s, that mm-hmm. had, you know, maybe a dozen members, was the Priory of Zion. Oh, boy. That was the Priory of Zion. He invented it. And that whole lineage going back to the Merovingian kings of France, he cooked that up the same way that, you know, Wiccans like to invent third-degree grandmothers going back to, you know, the, the Neil the Thick period or something. Um, now the the whole business about dis- being descended from from um, um, you know a child of Mary of, of Jesus by Mary Magdalene that was not something Plantard was into he was a devout Catholic but um, the three the three English filmmakers who ran across Plantard's claims went wow this would make a great documentary and proceeded to make documentaries in the, in the book Holy Blood Holy Grail out of it one of them I forget which one of the three was very into the whole uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene routine. Because, that, that, of course, that had been being battered around for some time. And, and so managed to insert that into it, to Plantard's great um, d- discomfiture, by the way. And, and so, yeah, that's where this whole business came from. It has nothing to do with actual history. It's, it, it is a really good example of why, whenever you're, de- excuse me, whenever you're dealing with something from the occult community, you want to check the footnotes. And, you know, especially when you're dealing with documents uh, that have been forged. I, uh, Scotty Roberts mentioned last yeah. week that uh, during, uh, and I forget exactly, I forget the date exactly, but I know that it was either sometime around, uh, well, like before the, the Library of Alexandria burned up, mm-hmm. uh, that, you know, these uh, rabbis apparently had gone into the temple and said, well, hey, you know, like we, we can, uh, you know, like these these documents were lost or, or, or you know, we can go in and essentially... Um, you know, complete this information for you, and kind of that same idea where there, you know, it's a possibility that certain information was brought into that uh, into the library mm-hmm. at that point that may have been perpetuated later on, that may have yeah. been concocted by you know like like fourteen fourteen individuals two thousand years ago, and who knows yeah. what you know, what was copied or what was kept going. So yeah, I- exactly. There's there's the there's the um, the same there's a similar story in the latter part of the Old Testament where I forget which king of Judah. Um, his several of his priests discovered this this lost document that was you know teaching the, the you know they, they, they put, for all practical purposes they cooked it up it was a reformation of religion and they they of course did the usual thing and slaughtered everybody who disagreed with their religious ideas <laughs> but yeah as they're off to, as people are off to do apparently as people as people <laughs> generally like to do it's one of those things but so yeah you the, the invention, inventing documents and backdating them to the dawn of time, if not before, is a, is a grand old practice, and you always need to be on, on you have your eyes open about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, that's true with, um, especially with the kind of thing that I'm researching in my book as well. You know, you don't, you can't just take these things at face value. You have to look at, at a wide range of sources, preferably from, from a range of cultures, and go, Okay, so what pa- what what is the pattern that connects? What is the pattern that makes sense of all of this? Um, and let's see, this, yeah, this go ahead. well, that that's kind of my idea because you're you're dealing with, uh, you know, let's say pe- pe- people who have been digging into temples or are bringing in, bringing in information into uh, other uh, troves of knowledge where they're they're uh, you know guarding it uh, profusely, but at mm-hmm. the same time, a, a lot of the knowledge that's been passed down. Um, you know, from thousands of years through just careful observation and trial and error is mm-hmm. what get, is, is through word of mouth. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, you know, if somebody says, okay, well, what I just, you know, I, I, as we were talking before we went on air, that uh, I was uh, in a, uh, you know, I had a car crash uh, this week. Mm-hmm. My car was completely written off. And I went out and said, instead of doing the research and going online, because I know that people can go online and say, okay, well, Oh, this dealership is very good, and anybody can write that that information down. 
Uh, but I went to other individuals who have had experiences with with dealerships and tenants. Said, okay, who is good? Who's not? Where should I go? What sh- what are the pitfalls that I'm looking at? And that word of mouth was then given to me, uh, you know, orally transmitted to me, and I use that information to. Uh, mm-hmm. essentially, you know, navigate the waters as best as possible through their trial and error and that accumulated mm-hmm. knowledge to to help get mm-hmm. myself a car. So yeah. it, it, going back to what information were uh, these individuals could have been looking for, um, mm-hmm. I, you know, you know, there there is a uh, and the idea that cathedrals have, uh, you know, been used potentially uh, to help increase the fertility of the surrounding land what kind mm-hmm. like what what is the, the the process that and what is the knowledge that they've been bringing forward from you know time immemorial to now to to kind of to do that mm-hmm. and, and yeah and the thing is the, the thing you have to remember is that they didn't necessarily know what was causing it all they had to know was how to make the effect happen i've hypothesized in my book that it may have been one of two phenomena or possibly both um, on the one hand, it's been shown that weak electric currents of the sort that flow through the Earth generally, there's it's telluric electricity, it's a known phenomenon, can be concentrated in certain geolog- by certain geological formations, it can be directed through the soil, and it causes improved plant growth. I'm not sure why, but there were back before chemical fertilizer became all the rage, back in the early 20th century, there was a whole bunch of research done, controlled double-blind studies, on what was then called electroculture where they you know they literally have a garden patch and you'd have a weak electric current flowing through it and the plants would have like a 40% better growth rate um you and could so say, there's, there's I'm sorry yeah go ahead uh, on on one layer you know you've got the you're mapping out the beginnings foundations of the temple and you're using you're looking for patterns in time and uh, mm-hmm. the seasons that's very important mm-hmm. for when you're planting crops for you know, exactly. that's, that's pretty blatantly obvious and then you get into mm-hmm. more subtle layers where uh, you know the idea of these these temples are placed on top of uh, caverns of waters and things like that. Like there's mm-hmm. aquifers under the pyramids, and you've well, got don't sort even of get this me whole other water pump there. electricity thing for the pyramids. Oh my goodness, there's so so many like oh man, oh okay, yeah. I, I can't even get into that. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of stuff going on. So yeah, you have on the one hand. Um, the temple serves as a timing mechanism. Uh, most temples are oriented so that and, and set up so that you can tell the season of the year. Remember, this is this is before printed calendars were common. Um, there were no many watch t- batteries. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, in fact, m- many, many, many cathedrals to this day have typically you'll have a, you'll have a, you know somewhere up in the stained glass window on the eastern end, or or on or on a window in the southern end, you will have a little square of pure white glass as opposed to all the colored stuff in stained glass and stuff. And that will send a single beam of light down onto the floor of the church. And the arc that it traces will pass certain little marks, which will tell you the year, or the, the, day, the day of the year, the day and month. So it'll move from you know this arc in the winter to this arc in the summer. And back in the day, that was how you timed your planting, of course. So you have that effect you have the possibility that water was involved and you have this possibility that electric that t- telluric electricity because that will also be shaped by um by geological locations and things like that and you know when when you're talking about something like a um something like the temple of solomon which is made of stone and, and coated with gold it's basically a huge storage battery and then you also have the possibility that they're doing something with um a very peculiar end of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, this is something that Dr. Philip Callahan, who's an entomologist, has research, researched extensively, very, very extensively. Moths and a lot of other night-flying insects communicate with one another on this, um, the part of the electromagnetic spectrum where microwaves overlap with infrared. Okay? Mm-hmm. And at that level, um, a lot of organic compounds naturally fluoresce at those, at those wavelengths also. And many plants also have little spikes that function as antennae in that wavelength. So there's in those wavelengths. So you've got this entire network of communication going on in the natural world. Then you take a big solid structure somewhere and you fill it with volatile aromatic substances. We call this burning lots of incense. And you use certain patterns of sound waves, which will cause the volatile aromatics to fluoresce in these wavelengths. And what's that, what is that going to do to the insect populations? What is it going to do with, for pollinators? What is it going to do for pests? Nobody knows. But is it possible that's one of the things that was going on here? I, I, I'm suggesting it as an option. It's, 
one of one of the one of the crucial things that I want to stress about this book, The Secret of the Temple, is that it is a first reconnaissance of unknown territory. I have far more questions than answers, and the, the book basically ends with a plea for other people who are interested to do their own research, to get out there, look into the situation, and say, okay. Does this make sense? And what about this tradition? And what about that tradition? I, I've already been in contact with with a Hindu guy from India who is who has a bunch of infra, very similar information about some very similar traditions in India. We and, were uh, we were just talking about the uh, the subject of uh, moths yesterday, and uh-huh. um, in a couple episodes ago, we were talking about the, the there was symbolism of the bees and the floor in the Vatican, and uh, mm-hmm. we also mentioned uh, Victor Grebenikov. Oh, yeah. studied, he was the entomologist who studied the scarab beetles, and they had this mm-hmm. microstructure on the back of the Egyptian scarab beetles that caused, uh, presumably helps with, the, it's like sort of an electrostatic levitation effect. Like it's, it's like ele- electrogravitics husks. through like natural form. And they look at the underside of the scarab husks with uh, like a thousand times strong uh, mm. magnification. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it, there's these little... Uh, so, it's like a crossed hair triangular structures with like these mm-hmm. little hairs coming off of them, mm-hmm. which they say is, is part of the uh, correlated electromagnetics of the subatomic. I, yeah, I'm choking on my words here. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's okay, a yeah. weird material science, but uh, as yeah. it relates to bugs. Mm-hmm. Bugs yeah. cool. And th- 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 one, of, one of the things that we're... <laughs> that human beings are very, very slowly figuring out is we don't have well, our senses, our particular set of senses, sight, hearing, um, touch, and so on, those touch on only a tiny, tiny fraction of the total amount of information flow in the universe or even in the world around us right now. Um, we, you know, natural selection has equipped us to um, pay attention to the things that were useful for social primates in East Africa back when we, back when our ancestors were social primates in East Africa, and that's all. And so there's these these wor- these whole worlds of complexity and knowledge and communication that we have no access to because we don't happen to have, say, antenna. You know, we don't. We we're not like moths. We don't have antenna with the, with all the little spikes that pick up on uh, electromagnetic radiation in the in the microwave spectrum. You know, we we pick up everything in visual in in the visible light spectrum. It's this very narrow range. There's the a group of scientists world. who just discovered this whole. Uh, it's like an ultraviolet uh, underwater phenomenon with uh, markings on fish. Huh. And like I, I had no, bees I heard can that also. Yet. Bees can see yeah, the ultraviolet bees. spectrum, so when they look at a flower, they see a completely different pattern in mm-hmm. the petals than we do. And uh, yeah, in fact, some... they, they found they found the bees see two different ultraviolet colors beyond. So there's 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 bee blue and bee violet, mm-hmm. which are further up the spectrum than ours, and they differentiate between the two. And they can they can see that's one, that's the other. You can train them to go for one to go for the other. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the, there's a bunch of scientists in the in the naval world that are shining ultra bright blue lights under the water um, Mm -hmm. in like coral reefs and looking at the there's a whole other pattern of visual patterns that show up that uh, are easily seen on the bodies of fish and things that you would only see Hmm. under very strong ultraviolet lights totally fascinating now knowing knowing that plants can uh pick up on the same the same wavelength or Mm -hmm. or very very similar wavelength well photosynthesis is essentially done through uh, through light so mm-hmm. if these buildings, uh, you know, and, and temples, if they're constructed in a certain way, and uh, let's say, or, you know, we could talk about orientation in, in a moment, mm-hmm. um, but if, you know, if these buildings are either amplifying or sending off uh, certain mm-hmm. certain radio waves in a certain way, like, do you think it's possible that you know, the plants are still picking this up and it's kind of like a, a uh, uh, you know, enhancing the photosynthesis? I don't know if it affects the photosynthesis or so, whether it would take some serious study to figure out huh. what exact fo- exact effects they're having on the plants, the insects, and so on. So not bioluminescence, but, but biofluorescence of marine organisms is the topic. Biofluorescence, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But so you've got you've got all of these possibilities that that we've only begun to just touch on what might be going on. It'll take a lot of experimentation to figure it out. So and and I, I want to, I want to stress that. It's going to take experimentation. People are very, very quick to go, you know, this must be, you know, 
those words must be, I distrust them instinctively. Usually when somebody says this must be the case, what they mean is I don't have any evidence. <laughs> Let's look into it. And uh, that seems to be a more constructive approach. But at any rate, so you've got these, you've got, you've got these two possible um, things that are going on. There may be other factors entirely. Um, it's very difficult to tell. But you've got the temple structure itself. You've got the various things that are done in the temple, the various traditional activities that are done um, in a religious context, but that also may have this effect on, on f fertility. You have traditions in a very large number of places about alignments or roads or subtle paths or currents that flow out from the temple. Let's not a forget about the congregation of people. I mean, yeah, there's a congregation of yeah, people in the, the country, temple, of course. The farmer's daughter yeah. at the temple. <laughs> yeah. you know, it, for here in Ottawa, it's like, you know, again, uh, th this is kind of a shout out to uh, my uh, mentor, uh, uh, Renaud Timson. It's like, if, there, if we have an experimental farm, and I know that those were all the rage in like the late 1800s. If you have an experimental farm, does that mean there's an experimental farmer's daughter? <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Think about that. <laughs> Ka -ching. Well, the thing, and the thing is, fertility was as important for human beings back in the day as it was for crops and things like that because at a time of very high child, childhood mortality um, and things like that, you needed a fairly steady birth rate to maintain your population. And so, yeah, the farmer's daughter is also coming to the temple <laughs> and, and getting bathed in the, in the radiation and so that if she was engaged in the usual pursuits of farmer's daughters, the likelihood of the childhood result might well go up. But again, Research needs to be done. I, I want to return to the alignments. So there's been a lot of confusion around the subject of lays or ley lines. Which was exactly the subject I was going to actually segue into. So I, I had same wavelength. Had <laughs> there we go. Um, <laughs> following a similar alignment, yeah. Um, this, this is a, it, it, it really is complex because a lot of people talk about lays, and very few of them go back and actually read Alfred Watkins, who was the, the guy who invented the concept. His idea, and I think it's, there's a huge amount of merit to it, was that the, the lay system in England was a system of, of navigation across land. Um, in primitive times, you had various kinds of landmarks. You would line up with one another and keep, you know, keep them more or less on a line, and that would get you to the ford in this, in this river, which would allow. So, so merchants and pilgrims and people like this knew how to get where they were going at a time where there were no roads much less maps, and you know, GPS wasn't even a dream yet. So there was that aspect. But there's also that, sec that curious secondary aspect where some of these alignments seem to have something that moves along them, some, some subtle influence, some energy. We don't know what it is. Um, there, was a, there was a program called the Dragon Project for some years in the, in the late 20th century where people um, raised the money to get the necessary equipment to test for unusual energy effects around stone circles and so on. And they found some whoppers. They were getting weird ultrasonic effects. They were getting weird electromagnetic effects. It, there was no funding, of course, other than just people, what people could scrape together and donate. None of the scientific societies would have anything to do with it, of course. But <clears throat> so very clearly... These alignments of standing stones and old temples and ancient churches built on the, site, on the sites of ancient pagan temples and so on, um, in at least some cases, there's an energy flow of some nature, telluric electricity, possible. Um, something else? Good question. More research needed. But in many cases, the temple tradition seems to link into this. Um, Japan is actually a really good test bed for that because they've got they they have a more or less continuous tradition dating back to very ancient times in the form of Shinto, the the indigenous um, Japanese polytheistic religion. And your basic Shinto shrine, this is going to sound very familiar for a Freemason. There is a line extending from the the Holy of Holies in in what we may as well call the East, um, straight down straight down through the front door and zooming up. You do not stand on the line. It is not done to stand on the line. You can cross it if you, you know, under certain circumstances, but you don't stand on the line. You don't walk up the line. Very much like the, you know, the line between the master station and the altar in a Masonic lodge, which you only cross under certain very specific conditions. Um, and the the Shinto tradition is that there is an influence that flows from the holy place in the, in, you know, in in the innermost sanctum sanctum of the of the Shinto shrine straight out through that that line 
And then it goes across country. And in many, the, the, there are a lot of ways in which the traditions there seem very similar to those of some, some of the lay traditions in England. So I don't know that anyone's done any kind of thorough comparative study there, but it's certainly something that deserves very careful attention. The ley line phenomena is something I, I've looked a little bit into, and mm -hmm. wh whether it's uh, ley lines between sacred sites in England, uh, I know that there uh, have been some people who've tried to find correlations between uh, the different sacred sites around the world, let, let's say like Angkor mm -hmm. Wat and and mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, the Giza complex and Easter Island, and you know, do you, like what, what do you think these these ley lines uh, like are? Is it, is it energy? Is it water? Is it uh, just, you know, is it the soul of, you know, like the soul of the earth, like in Final Fantasy VII, where, you know, there's this, uh, you know, like some, you know, some like experiment out there trying to like, you know, take over the world. Like, what, what, what's going on with that? A heck of a good question. Um, and again, remember that it doesn't have to be either or, it can be both and. Um, we don't know what's going on with ley lines or, um, I... I've seen a lot of very extravagant theorization as to where ley lines are, where you know the, the extent the extent of the network. Um, we simply don't know, and being willing to admit that and say, okay, here's a hypothesis, which is just a guess, is I think a good a good point. One of the interesting things is that the the lines themselves, where you have straight alignments, they're not natural. You, you um, can say, well, feng shui. where's the missing instrument if this is a, an energy form? Where's the instrument yeah. by, which, by which to mm -hmm. measure it? That, that's, that's the question. Now, of course, that was something that the Dragon Project tried very hard to come up with, measurement instruments. They, they did find that um, measuring um, electrical charges and other electromagnetic effects, they tend to get some weird reactions, but they were unpredictable. So there's something that um, people are, these, there, there's more research needed. But but I, w I want to return here in, in Chinese feng shui, which is their their science of of landscape arrangement. Their tradition is that natural flows always follow curves. When you have a straight line, that's something that was put there by people. And so and you have to be very careful about such straight lines, according to, the, to feng shui masters, because if you're not care if you aren't careful with them, they can be very destructive. They can suck the life energy out of. A, a locality, they can put too much energy you know, through the middle of your house, this kind of thing. And in fact, the, 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 lay, the lines, the alignments in England, the lays that Alfred Watkins tracked, connect man-made locations. You know, you have, a stand, you have a series of standing stones, you have um, sacred well here, you have old church there, always something was built. Similarly in Japan, um, these these alignments based on that extend out from Shinto shrines. Again, those were built there, and they're tori, the, the temple gates, the sort of gateways. Those are put there to to line up the force, force that would apparently normally flow along curves. Um, Imperial China used to have these these huge spirit roads zooming across very large parts of the of, of the Chinese Empire, which people did not travel on. It was considered very bad bad luck and, and disrespectful of the emperor and this kind of stuff. They were there for energy. So I'm a little... I, I, when, when people start talking about um, ley lines being everywhere, I'm not always so sure of that. I suspect that, you know, as usual, nature likes to move in curves. And where you find straight lines, they've been built, and they've been built by someone at some particular time for a purpose. It's kind of along the same idea why you don't have a TV in the bedroom if you're married. Yeah. Yeah, we we used my my wife and I used to have a, a TV in the bedroom like when we were living at oh. her apartment, and then we took oh, it out of there. And we when we moved to the new house, and we had one when we were living in uh, the house that I owned, and then we bought a mm -hmm. house together. And they're like, nope, no more TV. We're going to do the, fe the 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 feng shui thing, and you know, it's it's been uh, a lot better for the relationship I find overall. Like oh, yeah. I, just so, mm -hmm. it, it, like for for this type of this type of feng shui. Uh, philosophy is this uh, mm -hmm. kind of l the same idea that that's been built into uh, like the, the location uh, choosing and orientation of, of temples like mm -hmm. is, is it mm -hmm. sun based uh, like how, how does that that work well now now one, one the of the ancient Buddhists we can draw... also had no television in the bedroom <laughs> yeah that, that's true it was probably why they attained the language <laughs> <laughs> sorry um, I had to the, the, yeah no the, the, it's, a, it's a good point um, the there isn't just one thing you align on. 
And this is something you can learn from feng shui, by the way. If you, the, more, the, more you, the more you study feng shui, the more different layers of meaning and complexity get, a, get added onto it. You have, um, you have some aspects of it that derive from, the, from compass directions. You have some aspects of it that derive from landforms. You have some aspects of it that have to do with uh, you know, the, the relationship to sunrise and sunset. And you have aspect, just it, it's all over the place because it's it, it's not just it's not the sort of thinking, the sort of science we have nowadays, where you start from a supposedly a set of simple causes and, and go in this linear cause and effect method all the way out. Instead, you're collecting everything that works. You're testing it to make sure that it works, and then you're putting you're just kind of piling it up because. The, the the idea that nature is about linear cause and effect relationships is a very very modern Western notion. We're, we're so very, quick to divide ideas as opposed to add them together. Yeah, exactly, and that's that's just a cultural that's a cultural kink on on our part. It's simply our cultural habit. We like to think that way, which is fine. It's achieved some very interesting things, but it's also achieved some very stupid things, like televisions and bedrooms. <laughs> Well, you know, they, they can't have their uses, but uh, I'll leave that f- for the listeners' m- imagination. That's the bedrooms where the addition is supposed to happen. It's so we can watch Hell's Kitchen whenever we want. I'm telling you that. <laughs> okay. I, I, want, I want to learn how to make scallops, finally. Um, with uh, going back to ley lines, and mm-hmm. I, know, I know that there's a component of sacred geometry that, that uh, is related to this in some way. And mm-hmm. all, you know, going from small to big and the idea that even you know, the smallest component of reality it, it will be essentially the you know, very similar to the largest component of reality at, at a large enough scale. Is, mm-hmm. is there like a, a real, uh, is there a relation to um, how they were built in the ley lines to sacred geometry and, and, how, and like how, how was that figured out? Um, there does seem to be some such relationship. And again, but I'm, I'm going to be falling back on that, that same thing. More research is needed here. What we know is that certain ley lines, in, in Britain certainly, certain ley lines at certain angles relative to, um, the, re- relative to the, lines of, the lines of latitude, okay? Certain ley lines tend to be associated with certain kinds of, um, of sacred places places sacred to um, the Archangel Michael, for example, tend to be on particular kinds of lines at particular angles across the landscape. Um, there are locations that, have, that are sites of ancient sanctity that seem to be spaced around like the periphery of a circle, a circle perhaps divided into 12, 12 sections. John Michel did some really interesting work on that, and, and so on. Do we understand the underlying geometry behind it? No, we don't. One of the things we have to, and this is something, one of the things we have to keep in mind here, and this is something very difficult for modern people to think of. We think of we're, prog- we're, we're progressive. We have progressed. We know the truth, and everyone else before us was primitive, fumbling. I'm going to break my usual um, habit here and say, bullshit. In many cases, we're the ones who are fumbling to try to understand something of which we have no clue, that the ancients understood very, very clearly. Sacred geometry is a great example. Where the, really the modern revival of sacred geometry is is not much more than well actually I don't think it's quite a century old yet. And before then, you really have to go back to the Renaissance when you had people who understood it very well. And there's a lot of material in Latin that has never been translated on sacred geometry. And then before that, you're go, you're getting back into the Middle Ages, into the classical period, where there was a, a vastly better developed sense of how sacred geometry worked, how the different aspects functioned together or didn't function together. And since you know civilizations rise and fall, um, that's part of one of the one of the normal rhythms of history. You constantly have these situations where information is getting lost, and then people come come later and try to piece it together and make a system that works and maybe they do so and then that falls you know their civilization falls and, and you have to pick up the pieces again so we're, we, we've got a, a metaphor that I'm, I'm going to borrow from the novelist John Crowley who used it in, in one of his novels um, it's as though this immense machinery of, of gleaming metal and glass and so on was smashed thrown to the ground, trampled into the gutters, and all we have are chunks. And we've been going around, picking them up, and gathering them together one by one, and piecing them together, and say, okay, how does this fit? Does this, wow, these two pieces probably fit together. Click, there we go. 
and we don't have we don't even have a clear idea of what the whole mechanism was much less what it looked like we have a few sub assemblies maybe that we think pretty much this seems to work this way you know this this we, we, we pretty much understand now at this point the sacred geometry of the square root of two square root of three and golden proportion um, ratios we've got a sense of how those work how those fit together how people use them at least in the middle ages to lay out um, cathedrals and things like that and we have some idea of how that interfaced with other aspects of, say, mysticism on the one hand, operative occultism on the other, and so on and so forth. But it's very important not to lose track of the fact that we are picking up the fragments of something that we don't understand, and we're trying to make sense of them. And one thing, I'm going to go a little bit, like, way off on a tangent here. Sure, possibly. tangent away. Uh, and I'm going to try and connect it back in here. The ideas of sacred geometry and Freemasonry, everything that we've discussed so far, it seems to me that these are extremely advanced ideas that, you know, and I may, uh, I'm kind of an adherent of the idea that there there was a civilization that was lost around the uh, around the last ice age. Um, mm-hmm. And whether... I think the evidence for that is pretty good. Okay, well, if, if that's the case, and one of the things I've been trying to be able to connect, and literally one of the reasons why I started this show was to try and find out what knowledge was there and to try and link Freemasonry back to Atlantis or whatever mm-hmm. that was actually called because I strongly mm-hmm. believe that Freemasonry as a whole and it, you know the the core concepts of what the fraternity is supposed to be able to teach is the idea of okay this you know there there the, the universe and whether uh, people will say that I'm intelligent to uh, design uh, adherent or not um, I'm neither I just think that you know, if whether it was a fourth dimensional being that started this third dimension and just kind of kicked the world off in a certain direction, and just let it let it spin. That whatever techniques that were used to be able to either uh, in create this existence in this entire universe that we have, um, that the someone at some point in either some antediluvian age note picked up on this and said like oh this kind of makes sense and just started to build a body of knowledge around the his observances or her observances of the world at large and and said okay well you know if whatever being created the universe uh, created this they ha- must have had to have done an xyz so this kind of a, a observation translated into essentially what freemasonry has become and and the idea of you know construction or manifestation of whether it's ideas or matter or just building, you know, what, what uh, you know, let's say building companies or building buildings, and if it's done within a certain, um, uh, you know, within a certain framework and within a certain system, that it becomes a propagation machine, as it were. That it, it it's, uh, you know, like like businesses that are built around with certain uh, certain principles can g- generate great wealth and generate great wealth for not only the shareholders but the employees and uh, you know bring prosperity to the people who purchase that service from the company whereas others mm-hmm. that do not follow that framework are you know kind of like the goldman sachs and and you know the financial institutions <laughs> of the world where all they call is uh, cause is pain and misery except for a few select mm-hmm. few mm-hmm. so the idea was that somebody observed this and said okay well we have to be able to teach these principles to uh, on, you know the people who are ruling the um uh, you know r- ruling the nation as it were and mm-hmm. you know at some point that knowledge was lost but it was still carried over to like egypt and that mm-hmm. same kind of philosophy was integrated within the original uh, pre-dynastic, uh, uh, you know, times which uh, Graham ha- the Graham Hancock would call it Zeptepi, the, mm-hmm. the first time. Mm-hmm. And that kind of went from there to, let's say, you know, the Romans and the Israelis. And that same, that same knowledge then spread from, like, Egypt out to the Eastern philosophies and to Europe, which, you know, so uh, th- the idea of this type of sacred geometry being used within the construction of buildings uh, mm-hmm. to be able to nourish the land. Mm-hmm. I totally think that it, that's a hundred percent has credence because well, where, where, like, well, where could it have come from at the first time? But also at the same time, you know, for, for somebody to spend a hundred years in building a beautiful cathedral, that takes mm-hmm. thousands of years to be able to get that type of uh, precision and that type of specialized knowledge. It, it does not mm-hmm. appear overnight. Mm-hmm. 
No, in fact, um, to 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 add another data point to that, um, there's a fascinating book. Um, I forgot the name of the author. The title is Anaximander and the Architects, and it's point. It talks about the way that Greek philosophy and Greek temple architecture sprang up at the same time by way of the same people um, with imported ideas from Egypt driving both of them. Wow. And, yeah, oh, it's, it, it's yeah, I, I, that, oddly enough, that was my reaction. Because, um, in, and Alexander, who was, who was an early Greek philosopher, was also a major innovator in the building trades and in engineering. And the author of this book was pointing out there, was, there's, there is a weird sort of um, blind, intellectual blindness in modern scholars because they, teach him, they treat him as just a philosopher, which I, without realizing this guy also had these practical abilities and, the, and these things informed his philosophy. So there's actually a lot of stuff. There, there's a lot of connection there. Um, and, you know, that that it seems to me that would follow very directly from what you're saying. Now, one thing one thing I'm going to suggest with regard to sacred geometry, um, and also generally with with es- the esoteric philosophy that underlies it, the whether the world was ki- was as you say kickstarted by you know a fourth dimensional being or something, um, it's a commonplace of esoteric philosophy. The creation is not something that happened once. It's constantly happening. You can watch it happen. You know, any time you watch a solution with, with say, a lot of a lot of salt in it, you get water. Um, you you heat up water. You dissolve a whole bunch of salt on it. You let the water cool, and then you drop a single crystal of salt into it and it goes shh, crystallized. Watch the way that happens. You're seeing creation in in process, and those salt crystals are all cubes. They all have an innate geometry. Watch a plant grow. Most plants follow. Um, the golden proportion in their growth patterns to an astonishing degree. There are some really neat books that have been written on the sacred geometry of plant growth. And so these patterns, the, these, these basic patterns of creation are patterns that, that shape everything that comes into being in the natural world. And if you understand them and you then say, okay, we, you know, our, our hypothetical Atlantean, uh, Atlantean high priestess, let's say, is saying, okay, these patterns govern everything that happens in the natural world, and they, you know, that that's, and it is through these patterns that the natural world has the harmony, the balance, the beauty that it does. If we use the same patterns to guide our constructions, what's the logical result? Well, the logical result is that you're going to, essentially, you're going to have the harmony, the exactly. beauty. Exactly, exactly. And so, and this is something, this is what has been guided, what has guided the thought and the practice of sacred geometers since, as far back as we have records, that they, they realize that there are these innate patterns, innate geometrical, numerical, musical, astronomical patterns, the old quadrivium, the four sciences of the, of the Pythagorean world. Um, these patterns exist in everything, and if you work with them, you're going, to get, you're going to do a lot better than if you try to just ignore them and say, no, 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 I'm going to stick up this gigantic steel and glass penis in the middle of the city. We call them skyscrapers, but you know what they are. Uh, here, up here, we call them Trump Tower. <laughs> Not inappropriately. I, I think one of the um, ideas you're getting at there is, uh, you know, Things like uh, the cubit is uh, pi minus phi squared, and uh, you mm-hmm. find those things in in all these ancient temples as well as uh, yeah. in nature. And it, yeah. it's sort of like uh, you have this. Nate and phi is like nature's approximation of approaching pi. Yeah. So you've, you've got something that's infinite, and then something that's also getting constantly closer and closer towards mm-hmm. the infinite. Uh, yeah. Like two parallel yeah. lines that never touch, but are constantly. So it's tilted, so it's constantly closer, getting closer yeah. to the other or something. Which goes back yeah. to the whole circle, a point with a circle with two columns mm-hmm. on either side, where there are two lines that are going on for, at, at infinitum, but never necessarily meeting. Mm-hmm. It, but they're brought the into a relationship line. with... Yeah, they're brought into a relationship with mm-hmm. one another by the circle and the point. And there's a, you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can work with on that basis. But, so you have it, you know, with, within, within temples, within cathedrals, you have these very very specific systems of proportion 
And you were mentioning, well, one of you was mentioning earlier that, that there were actually competing systems of proportion. I and that there was were, me, actually. But... Yeah, that was you. Okay. In medieval Europe, um, there were the ad quadrat, the people who did ad quadratum and the people who did ad triangulum. And they were, you know, they were all um, operative masons, but they belonged to different guilds in different parts of, of Europe. And there were real quarrels between the two. I mean, one guy and had the, the protractor, ad- the other guy had the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, one guy had the square. And exactly. in fact, one of the re- one of the reasons that um, we know that the uh, the operative guilds that gave rise to modern Freemasonry um, was was on the odd quadratum side. What hangs around the master's neck? It's a square. It's a Euclid's it's a square. Uh, Euclid's forty uh, third uh, theorem, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Hmm, interesting. Okay, in America, it's just a plain square. Yeah, it, the it's for, up, the. Yeah, that, yeah, that's up here in Canada. I know that there are like the Grand Master may have uh, in certain jurisdictions will actually have the 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 uh, uh, compasses, and uh, to, to anybody out there, uh, compasses is that's the thing that you use in geometry class out of your protractor set. Uh, a compass not the, is not the thing you, that finds north for you. Exactly. Yet. <laughs> There's two two parts, two arms, two compasses. That's why we call it compasses. So yeah, exactly. And so, um, but yeah, and in fact, um, in the Scottish Rite, at a certain point, one is told that one is passing from the square to the compasses, from the you know, and, and in fact, the French, some of the French traditions that fed into the Scottish Rite had connections to the adranculum side of the thing. So you you actually you, you literally had fistfights on. There was this this, um, this situation in. Um, let's see, it was in the, 15, in the very early 15th century, I think it was in Milan. They were rebuilding the cathedral. Milan was a, bit, was a, was a very important city in those days. They had a lot of money. They were going to completely rebuild the cathedral and make it an absolutely gorgeous thing. And they brought in um, master masons and, um, and fellow crafts and apprentices from all over the place, all over Italy and southern Germany and things like that. And the problem was that about half of them were on the ad quadratum side and about half of them were on the ad triangulum side. And there, it turned into this complete brouhaha because they were debating and snarling at each other and insisting that it should be this way, it should be that way. And finally, the Duke of Milan sent away for Francesco Giorgi, who was the greatest sacred geometer of the age. It was a little like, you know, calling, you know, if somebody called Albert Einstein to come settle a quarrel in the physics department. <laughs> um, and so, but Francesco Giorgi came and listened to everybody and worked out a, a, a system whereby the ground plan was I think the ground plan was ad quadratum, and the elevation was all ad triangulum, and it still worked. Well, because you take two triangles. Going, well, if, if you take two triangles and you, you like you you know you flip one the uh, one way and you flip mm-hmm. one the other way, you put them together, you get a square or or a uh, rectangle. So, wh- depending depending on the triangle. Well, yes. true. Yes. Um, yeah. Exactly. It, uh, but I, but no, it's it, it was really it was really elegantly done, and of course he was he was using. He's using the fact that you can you can get a fairly close approximation to the golden proportion out of both. Actually, you can get the golden proportion if you know what you're doing out of either the square root of two, the ad quadratum ratio, or the square root of three, the ad triangulum ratio. And so, yeah, it was just it was this this marvelous thing. And so everyone was satisfied. And they built the cathedral, or rebuilt the cathedral. So yeah, it's it, it was it was a big deal. But this is more of that piecing together process because. When the medieval master builders got going, when, when, when stone buildings started being built again in Europe, um, they were importing whatever ideas they could get from the Byzantine Empire. They were importing ideas from the Arabs. Well, the, when, after the Crusades, um, there was a, a lot of information picked up from the, the conquered crusader states in the Holy Lands um, from the locals as to stone building. All that came back we, by the Knights Templar were a major factor there. Um, they had they actually had their own their own building crews because they had them they had six huge castles in the Holy Land. They had all of these uh, preceptories and chapter houses and farms and everything in Europe to raise money. So they had they needed builders. This is also and why they, I, I kind of like whenever somebody says like oh Freemasons are taking over the world and you know Illuminati confirmed and you know Illuminati this I'm like man we can't even decide on where the pancake breakfast is going to be monthly half the time like what <laughs> what the hell are you talking about like seriously like do do you, do you know how much disagreement we have within mm-hmm. our own crap like oh man like oh like oh jeez <laughs> if if the Freemasons actually ran the world. There would be endless debates, endless unsolved debates, and way too much bad coffee. Brother, uh, I have a joke for you. How, Go ahead. How many Freemasons does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many? 
uh, one, but uh, it has to go to committee first, and it'll be there for about two years. <laughs> That's good. Um, a, a parallel um, version is how many masons does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> the light bulb never gets changed. <laughs> exactly. We're supposed to change. We don't change. <laughs> The light bulb goes that out. That we are going over whose worked, fault it was. <laughs> that light bulb wor- worked perfectly well back in 1952. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh my um, goodness. Okay, that's good. No, no. The, the, the world, the world has many things to worry about, but a Masonic takeover is not one of them. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> the only reason the world's still spinning is that we're not in charge. <laughs> Although, you know, most of the young Masons I know um, constantly make jokes about, yeah, we'll have to, have to, you know, we'll have to subvert civilization tonight. It's a lot tonight. I'm, well, what, I, I, man, I joined for the virgin sacrifices and the sex orgies. I don't yeah, know what you're I, talking about. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, 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 still, I'm still waiting for the, for the you know, the, the we, No Limit Master. We figured they the had more fun down in the States. The invitation to the satanic orgies, yeah. <laughs> Now, the like th- this is a pretty good segue into Freemasonry in terms of the uh, like the the ritual construction and and trying to be able mm-hmm. to, to devise um, you know lessons for the brethren who are listening. And I know that there are quite a few because I've told them all you're on. Um, mm-hmm. How how has that that uh, you know that's how has the ritual kind of been brought forward from the ancient times to now? Like what wh- what are the parallels? Well, this now now first of all, <laughs> that's. One of the difficulties in answering that is we don't know much about the ancient rituals. For example, the rituals of the Eleusinian Mysteries, completely gone. Nobody knows. There, there are a few scraps of detail about what might have happened in a few old Christian sources, and that is it. Um, Egyptian temple rituals, we have a few scraps here and there, um, mostly hymns. Um, we simply don't know. You tra- if you trace the trace Masonic ritual back um, as far as we've got record, um, when the first Grand Lodge was founded in 1717, there were only two degrees in the Blue Lodge. There was um, Edward Apprentice and Fellow Craft. The Master Mason degree showed up from somewhere, nobody knows where, around 1720. And all of a sudden, it's there. And thereafter, um, additional degrees start cropping up like, like mushrooms after a good rainstorm. Um, Probably, certainly, the, the the research I've done suggests that um, the degree the degrees that are um, Knight Mason on the one hand, and then um, the order the 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 illustrious order of the Red Cross, which uh, which is part of the part of the the order of Knights Templar, and then um, let's see, I believe it is the fifteenth and sixteenth degrees of the Scottish Rite. Yeah, the uh, they're Rose all Croix. they're all versions they're all versions of the same degree. They yeah, all have to do with Zerubbabel's journey back to, um, you know, to journey from Jerusalem to Babylon and so on. That, that's probably, those are probably um, descended from the oldest of the of the higher degrees to be invented. The Royal Arch came fairly quickly thereafter, and things proliferated um, from there on. But what was going on before 1717? We have a few scraps of information about um, European guild initiations. Not much. Um, in terms of the ancient, um, the ancient Greek and, and, and Roman mysteries, we know mm, a little more than squat, but not much. In terms of rituals, in as I mentioned, in Egypt, um, we know very little. Um, enough that the, enough to know that there are some weird parallels between ancient Egyptian. Um, offering rituals to their gods and the rituals currently practiced in Japan in Shinto shrines to make offerings to the kami. But that's just, that's another head scratcher. And, but, but we're really, we're really floundering in the dark here because to the extent that material was passed on, it was passed on in secret. Nothing was written down. Everybody and, and people seem to have kept their mouth good and tightly shut the whole time. And so, you know, we don't know. Have you heard anything of the tinners guilds or the silversmith guilds and the old pipe organs that they used to do these gigantic church pipe organs? We were mm-hmm. hoping to uh, chat about like acoustics of temple design and um, I don't know I don't know anything with, yeah uh, I don't know anything like as much about that as I should. 
um, certainly, I mean, all the old guilds, they had their rituals, they had their traditions and teachings and customs. And acoustics, again, that's, that's, a, that's a huge field that um, very little has been done, done with so far. Um, certainly, strange acoustic effects are something you find in old sacred spaces all the time. Here's an example that I, that I discovered, I, I had a chance to experience personally. Um, if you go to, in southeastern England, you go to the little town of Wilmington. Um, up on the hill side above Wilmington is the Wilmington Longman, which is a chalk figure, a uh, human being holding a sta- one staff in each hand. Okay. Now, if you go up onto the figure, we want you to take two people, have one person go up onto the figure, onto the head or chest of the figure, and the other person stays on this flat area just below the feet. You can have a conversation. You're, you're hundreds of yards from each other. You can have a conversation in a normal tone of voice, and each of you can hear every word the other says. The entire hillside has been carefully shaped so that it bounces the sound waves back and forth. If either of you leaves that leaves the, the, the focus points of that, the person in the flat area walks you know, 20 feet to one side, the person up on the head of the thing walks you know, 20 feet in a different way, the effect vanishes. We have a curve but, like that built into part of a monument right near Parliament Hill in Ottawa. Yeah, so you get you get that kind of that kind of that kind of communication effect. There are buildings that are designed so there are two places, and yeah, you can you can talk right back and forth between them, and nobody else in the building can hear your conversation. What I also found cool is is that uh, this is a plug to the old stereo nightclub in Montreal. Um, I, I'm I'm a DJ, or at least was formerly a DJ in a different life, and, and nightclub owner mm-hmm. and promoter. Uh, mm-hmm. There was a sound system out there produced by a company called Phazon. And mm-hmm. their specialty was producing sound that was uh, sound systems that were so clear and so accurate in their reproduction that at Stereo Nightclub, back uh, before it burned down under mysterious circumstances, which I don't know about, uh, to its current, it, you know, it's Montreal. So again, for anybody who's from Montreal, if you're listening, yeah, you, you probably know what's up. Um, but at the same time, uh, you could stand on the old stereo dance floor and have a conversation with somebody at decent voice volume without yelling. Because the mm-hmm. sound system was positioned and tuned in such a way that you would have the amazing bit, you would feel the bass in you, you would hear the bass, but it wouldn't interfere with the uh, uh, with the audio from your voice to the individual who was two feet in front of you while you're dancing. And in mm-hmm. certain cases, your shirt would be off. But you know that's that's uh, that, that that's personal <laughs> choices, and you know we respect I would them. Imagine. You need to start DJing some polyphonic music so we can get some acoustic levitation up in this temple. Oh, we we tried that at Euphoria <laughs> once. It didn't work out too well for the <laughs> for the speakers. There's too much compression, and yeah, the compression kills sound quality. So mm-hmm. well, there you go. Well, start start by trying to levitate a scarab. I think that was probably a good, a good place to be in. <laughs> now, oh, now there there are certain uh, in, uh, proponents of the idea that it, you know sound or word you know either sound or words of power or I should say. Mm-hmm. Uh, words have power, and uh, I know that there are uh, people who have reported that there are monks in somewhere in Nepal or Tibet that can levitate stones based on beating of drums and chanting within a circle. Um, and you know, there are some people who kind of link that back to Freemasonry and say, well, you know, we say certain words and we have certain sounds that are said all in unison within the lodge, and uh, whether that is either to be able to uh, have a certain effect within the energy around the lodge or within that area when it's tiled or to produce some type of effect uh, you know that kind of goes within within the idea of like you know the the you know the the the, the ceremony itself and how mm-hmm. you know the uh, all, all major churches do that it's just we don't talk about it so <laughs> well, I'm, well this is the den of lore we talk about everything <laughs> right. um it was it was a tradition in ancient greece that the walls of the city of thebes were actually raised by sound waves. Um, we're not doing those concave them. ceilings too often anymore. Yeah, there we go, yeah. <laughs> but they, yeah, they, the the one of the founders of, of the town of Thebes, Amphion, had um, the necessary ability um, with music, who was literally directing sound waves to make the stones rise. Whether that's meant literally or symbolically, it's a really interesting question. I personally would like to see it. But I'm not going to. I'm not going to discount. One of the things that I think is absolutely crucial: don't just because our current scientists don't know how to do it doesn't mean it can't be done. Well, we can we can levitate with sound now. It's just on a much smaller scale because we haven't exactly. we haven't figured it out. Like you know, putting it within a certain wavelength, and this mm-hmm. it, you know, sound is a wave, 
and a lot of mm-hmm. uh, the light energy is also a wave. So, like, mm-hmm. again, that's kind of the whole idea that energy itself is a wave. So mm-hmm. whether you're levitating with, uh, you know, growing stuff with uh, light waves, whether you are mm-hmm. trying to catch on, uh, you know, a, a AM radio or which, you know, for... Mm-hmm. Which was like the podcast of its time. Uh, hello, George Norrie, <laughs> and your coast to coast AM. Love you, love you to death. And mm-hmm. you know th- it's the same idea. So mm-hmm. uh, you know I, I don't I don't think it, I would not discount it. It's actually something exactly. that we've we've discussed uh, uh, Alex and I at length. Um, mm-hmm. And so, sonoluminescence is actually something we've brought on to the uh, the show on numerous times. Where the idea that you've got a star in a jar, that if you uh, mm-hmm. com- uh, compress a uh, a bubble in uh, that's suspended in water with sound waves that actually kind of compresses and starts to emit light. And mm-hmm. uh, scientists can't necessarily explain how this happens yet. And mm-hmm. we don't know if it's yeah. a start of fusion or not. So, Yeah, something, some kind of energy release is going on. Where it's from is a really interesting question. And again, <laughs> listeners are going to get bored with this phrase, but it's necessary. More research is needed. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, like, it's like alchemy. Um, that's something that I've done a fair amount of research into, and the the evidence does suggest that there does seem to be some kind of way to transmute elements. Um, the fact that our current scientists can't do it without um, you know large amounts of heavy radiation doesn't mean it can't be done. Well, they say a they chicken can yet. do that. So if you <laughs> if you monitor how much uh, sodium a chicken eats versus how much sodium comes out of a chicken, there's somehow mm-hmm. more sodium coming out of a chicken than they're putting into the chicken. So yeah, it's got, like a biological, biological organism. Louis, 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 Louis Cavron's Kever, biological transmutations. I would love to see those experiments replicated. So why do I have to salt um, my chicken when I cook it then? <laughs> no, the problem is you're salting your chicken and it's, it's turning the chicken. It's turning the salt into something else. Well, I'm, I'm um, Croatian, so we, that means we have to use a lot of salt. Oh, there we go. Getting back I, to I fertility and temples, uh, <laughs> th- there's also that other tradition where the, in the in the basement of some of those old uh, mm-hmm. temples from around the world, they would have the stick and they they would measure the water levels and then judge mm-hmm. fertility in the upcoming season based mm-hmm. on low and high water marks. Have you yeah. run across that in some two, of your work? Or? There, there are two broad way, sets of locations the temples are placed in. It, it really varies from from cultural tradition to cultural tradition. Um, in Egypt and in India, temples were, oh, the, the religion, the, in, in Egypt, well, I'll, I'll clarify, but most of all Hindu temples and the great majority of, um, of, of Egyptian temples were built sufficiently in low places, sufficiently low-lying, they could dig a trench down and hit water. And there's actually, there, there, are, there are important symbolic reasons for that, but it may be, there may be some other things going on. In other places, especially Greece, and then, of course, the Temple of Solomon was on a high place, and some others also, instead you have the temple up on a raised section of ground. You're well above the ground. Um, and then you have other places, such as Japan and medieval Europe, where you have some of each. So the, there may be several different modes of working with the technology there may be you know if you need to worry about your groundwater yes you may well build your temple low mm. and make sure you have a, a water measure in the basement because that's one of the ways you track what you're going to be doing for you know with this year's agriculture i, I had heard they you kept know, that part secret so that they would know whether they should store more grain or uh, uh-huh. Whether they should hoard the grain or you know, those types of decisions, mm-hmm. which goes to the yeah. the idea of uh, some people have stated that the pyramids could potentially have been uh, uses usages for storage of grain during times of of uh, you know great great upheaval. I thought they were leveraging uh, back of the covenant filled with monatomic gold to influence the entire water system of the Nile. Oh God, there you go again with the monatomic gold. <laughs> <laughs> but. But so there's there, there are these there are these many different ways of doing the thing. Now well, the, you mentioned secrecy though, and this is this is another major difference between difference between the way people tend to think in ancient times and the way we think now. Um, nowadays, we tend to think that knowledge ought to be available to everybody. You know, it's it's we we have everything. The, this for dummies, that for the complete idiot. Um, if you were the grain and, merchant, you'd be pretty tight with the priests and with the exactly. with the water stick in the bottom of the temple. Well, in in many places in Egypt, for example, um, the temples were the grain silos, so it was you know it was real close there. But secrecy was to to the ancient to most ancient cultures, knowledge was meant to be secret. 
you did not pass around knowledge um, you know, readily. You did not give it out. That would be that was just you, what an appalling what an appallingly bad idea. Of course, you didn't do anything of the kind. And so, every kind of trade secret, every kind of um, of course, religious teachings, all of these things were passed on under oaths of secrecy, um, not unlike the, the pledges that each of us takes as a Freemason, which in fact descend from the pledges that um, that were taken by operative Masons to say, you know, we, well, you, I know, I'm not going to pass on our trade secrets. We're still missing the acoustics and the megalithic block moving. Yeah, yeah, that's a big yeah. Deal. You know, we, we we're not, we're not going to let anyone know, else know how we do that, um, and. And so this idea of secrecy was, it was just that that's the, everyone assumed that all important knowledge was secret and you had to earn access to it. It was not a matter of picking up megalithic block moving for dummies. You didn't want dummies to be moving megalithic blocks. They might squish people. Can I grab that as a book title for myself? Yes. Don't, don't, don't squish yourself <laughs> between these blocks. Don't the squish, yeah, don't squish. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Splat. <laughs> and so, so yeah. Um, so secrecy is, it was just it was just second nature back in, in ancient times. And that, that always needs to be kept in mind when we're looking at, well, you know, how come there's no written trace of this? Well, that's because people didn't write it down. Um, there was a person who um, wrote down the ritual, the, 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 you know, did a disclosure of the rituals of the Eleusinian Mysteries. His name was Diagoras. He was called Diagoras the Godless. And... Um, he, I, he he didn't live very long, and the copies of his work did not survive him. E- easy for us to complain, but when was the last time you made a, co- a copper scroll? <laughs> there you, you know, go. Like, yes. yeah, for exactly. your great, 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 great grandchildren to discover. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so 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 that's something that's something we need to keep in mind. But of course, the other, the flip side of that is that secrets can get lost. And one of the things that I, that I actually talk about at some length in, in the book, and one of the things that I think has not been sufficiently kept in mind, is that it's part of our Masonic tradition that our most important secret is lost. We do not have the true word. We have a substitute word. We do not have the true secrets of Master Mason. We have substitute secrets. And my the theory that I, that I argue in the book is that the people who put together Freemasonry uh, on its, as, a speculative, as a speculative order in the early 18th century were aware that there was a great secret. There was something really important that had been passed on by the operative Masons back in the day. They did not have that anymore. And the reason they, they invented the Master Mason degree and that they have this, this idea that you know, every Mason is pledged to seek out the lost word was precisely was their idea was we were going to hunt this puppy down. We we're going to find out what it is, and you know, and and they and they didn't, they didn't succeed. Well, that, that that's what surprised me. It's like it, it, here up here in the uh, uh, Scottish Rite, like you know, we learned the quote unquote lost word in the fourteenth degree, and you're like sitting there going, "Shit, we're halfway there. That's it." And then it's like, "No, there's more, man." You, you, like you get, you got. Yeah, I guess they, there's in the Scottish Scottish Rite down here. There are three different lost words. <laughs> There's one in the 14th, one in the 18th, and one in the 32nd. Yeah, and like, you know, yeah, and so and then the, the, you, you go. To, you, yeah, there are some of the, if, if you get in some of the more obscure um, side degrees and some of the things that have gone veering off from Freemasonry, you'll find yet others. There's, I mean, there's probably enough lost words out there to fill a small dictionary. Um, <laughs> the, the, but, Webster's Lost Dictionary. <laughs> Webster's Lost Dictionary. I like 32nd that. 32nd edition. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we decipher a 15th century image in the clouds while we're at it? I see a dinosaur. A if we're looking for something <laughs> fleeting, you know. There, just... there, there's a bonfire with a witch attached to it. And yeah, there we go. There, there's Jesus in my toast. And, uh, yeah, I think that, that's good for the 15th century. There we go, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so, but the, the, the idea that that we don't have the secret, that the lost word remains lost, that it needs, that, you know, we need to hunt it down. That was one of the things, that, that's one of the things that has really struck me in my time in masonry. And all these these attempts to say, well, no, no, this is the lost world. No, this is, no, you know, the, the, um, at the risk of offending anybody who doesn't like Monty Python, I, I've been tempted to say the true lost word is ni, ni. Uh, you know, I was just thinking that I'm like, well, you know, the, uh, yeah. 
that that will be the fourteenth degree of that movie, and then the secrets of uh, how to throw the uh, the holy hand grenade of Antioch. That would be there. We go. Yeah, exactly. Know, no, yeah. Notice it was only yeah. in the hands of the priests. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Just you know, just make sure there's no like rabbit that has the teeth. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my misspent youth. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! I've got friends who know the entire movie that, but, but like by by heart. My wife and I actually bonded over that movie. That's one of the one of the movies that I, that her and I got together on. I, I'm I'm delighted to hear that. That's you know uh, that was I, I I knew most of it by heart at one point, although it's been a while. Um, no, but no, yeah, no, I, going I, back I, to the Knights I, of the Temple and and the yeah. Lost Word, I I know that there are some proponents, and it's talked about within the uh, you know at length, and whether it's allegorical or not, that. The idea of the lost words being in the temple at some point, and again, it being kind of antediluvian towards, uh, mm-hmm. you know, go, going back to the uh, the the pillars of Enoch. Mm-hmm. Hey, like, wouldn't that be more allegorical towards the the lost secrets of the lost keys of Freemasonry? And mm-hmm. you know, the the whole idea of 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 our show is to kind of like figure out what the heck those secrets are, kind of, because no one's mm-hmm. been able to find them. Everyone's like, oh, I know what the secret is, and, well, but you, you know. So, yeah, every everyone everyone has everyone has their best guess. Yeah, but here's a yeah, here's a question um, out of left field, if I may. If you ahead. were going to build a temple today, mm-hmm. and uh, threw all the tools in front of you, what would be your order of operations? Having studied so many temples, okay, I would start by looking for a location that I, I'd, I'd start if I had if I had the, you know I, I would need some some pretty serious funding to do this. I would start by getting the necessary um, instrumentation to find a site that had a fairly high amount of uh, telluric electricity flowing through it. There, you want a um, a conduction discontinuity under the ground which kind of channels the um, the telluric electricity up toward the surface. It's like an aquifer or something. Uh, there there are various things that will do it. Um, often it's actually often it's a it's a um, an intrusion of, of rock or, or clay or something that isn't water, that isn't permeable to water. Okay. okay. So there are various things, but you can detect one of these things. So I need to get the right site. Um, I would then get get some some brother masons out to uh, well of course get the, get the space clear. Get some brother masons out on um, probably dawn on the um, spring equinox to kind of um, split the difference and align it properly. I would lay the thing out um, using um, one of the standard um, systems of sacred geometry, probably the, you know either the ad quadratum or the ad triangulum. Lay the thing out. I'd make sure it was built of paramagnetic stone. That's a detail we haven't gotten to yet, but that's a fact. Um, basically, construct the whole thing properly. Um, have it, you know, uh, do all the, the appropriate rituals at the laying of the cornerstone and everything, and get the thing in place, and then um, start doing appropriate ceremonies inside, and see what results you get. I would, you know, put the thing in the middle of um, set, set up set up garden beds all around it. It was actually it was actually very traditional for um, old fashioned temples to have a green belt around them. I'd do the same thing with your trees or a garden bed or something like that, and just start experimenting with the with with the thing and see whether growth close by was um, significantly amplified over, say, um, another garden in a similar location five miles away. Uh, are you familiar with uh, Ross Hamilton? Doesn't ring a bell. Uh, Ross Hamilton, he he's done a lot of work with uh, the Star Mounds and Serpent Mounds in Ohio. Uh, okay. Yeah, you mentioned. Yeah, you mentioned him before the before we started. We went on the air. Yeah. Yeah. We he was. Uh, he, we featured him in episode nine. It was a, a fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought it was a fantastic episode. I had like half a bottle of scotch for that one, so I had a lot of fun. <laughs> um, but he mentioned very like pretty much exactly what you're saying. He did it from the North American, uh, mm-hmm. like Native North American side, and mm-hmm. he's like yeah. these these star mounds were built in specific areas specifically to, uh, you know, promote growth in the area. Mm-hmm for mm-hmm. agriculture uh mm-hmm. and the idea of you know you you had mentioned briefly on uh, the certain stones that were built or mm-hmm. that were that were used uh, the serpent mound in, in ohio is mm-hmm. actually built on a it's it's a kind of like a magnetic stone like it it could have been a meteor at one point or another mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. but it's electromagnetic in nature and like compasses go wild near the thing apparently 
And that, that, is, that is so common around megalithic sites. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are standing stones in Britain that will make compasses go at 90 degrees from, from the regular. There's, yeah, so go on, and then, I can, then we can talk about materials a bit. So, like, that was kind of the idea behind this type of, me- this, this particular megalithic site and how it was mm-hmm. oriented to the stars and to Draco. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like, mm-hmm. we had an entire presentation on it, and I, I remember most Sweet. of it. Well, I, I, again, I remember most of it. Like, I remember the presentation, don't remember it in detail, but that's, that's Glenn Fittick's fault, I'm guessing. Uh, <laughs> but, you, you there's yeah. A lot you, be, there's a lot that can be blamed on good <laughs> much. <laughs> And it, one of the interesting factors that we learned about that particular site was that lightning strikes to mm-hmm. that site were attracted to it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is it something that's common within a lot of the megalithic sites? Absolutely. Um, strange weather effects. Actually, that's something that, that was something associated with the Temple with the Temple of Solomon. Before the Temple of Solomon, um, there were certain, according to the Talmud, there were certain nasty weather effects that happened all the time. Once the temple was built, those stopped. While the temple stood, they used to get south winds that brought, that brought rain. When the temple was destroyed, those stopped. <laughs> so there, the idea that possibly something is going on here is charging the atmosphere with electrical charges, which can strongly influence weather and lightning strikes and things like that. That's another factor. Megalithic sites generally have all kinds of strange effects wh- wh- which, with regard to weather, with thunder and lightning. In particular, it is, a, it is a tradition and apparently fairly well documented one in Britain. You do not dig up a mound, one of the old megalithic barrows. If you do, there will be a thunderstorm. And hmm. how does this relate to, like, I'm not sure how much you're known for researching, uh, like, Pacific uh, cultures, but this would be very similar to uh, Nan Madal and how uh, Nan Madal, which, which mm-hmm. was essentially built, like, it, it was somewhere in Polynesia, um, and, oh, yeah. this, and essentially like, it was built of basalt, uh, mm-hmm. which has a lot of iron in it because it's, it's essentially a rock, you know, from the earth, from, from, vol- from volcanoes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cool. Yeah. It's cool. It's lava, it's lava that cooled in the air, yeah. And uh, Nan Madal and a lot of the structures that were around there, and again, we're probably going to go into the idea of Mu when it comes to this, or, or uh, I forget the other name for it. Help me out here. Lemuria. Lemuria, Actually, thank you. Lem- mm-hmm. Lemuria is further south and further west, but we can get to that. We were, we were <laughs> chatting the other day about... Uh, Edward, oh, we have no time limit. We Ed- can go as Edward deep as you Edward Leeds Scallion and the Coral <laughs> Castle down in Florida. I, I <clears> imagine <throat> you're familiar with that. Yeah, somewhat familiar. It's been a while since I've done, but I read about that in the day. Yeah. So you know how he was, how he was moving those blocks of stone remains something that the, the blocks of coral, um, something that I think nobody has yet figured out. Well, the we're magnetic to... flywheel and the the tripod mm-hmm. that he was tr- transmitting we're these waves to. We're supposed to go there on like okay. our, on an excursion at some point, but Ooh, cool. well, yeah, you, you know, I come up with the guests. He comes up with the excursions. Uh, with regards to Nanamadal, the idea was that th- that particular site was built, and a few others were built around it, particularly to um, uh, to protect Sun- what was at the time Sundaland, which was mm-hmm. uh, the um, Indonesian uh, uh, archipelago, mm-hmm. which you know was above water at the time before the mm-hmm. last ice age from yeah. hurricanes. And when mm-hmm. that culture that was there was lost or went under or what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, all those other sites that were around there, uh, you know, were essentially un- left unprotected. And that was all mm-hmm. to protect the food baskets within mm-hmm. that particular archipelago, and, mm-hmm. you know, which, was again, was above, above ground that were growing rice, mm-hmm. to, to make yeah. sure that they had calm, you know, calm seasons. Yeah. Now, I, Sunderland is an interesting point, because this is, this is one of those bits where um, people will tend to put down the, the various occult traditions and so on, okay? Um... Lemuria, when, it's first, when it first shows up in occult literature in the writings of Helena Petrovna Blavatsky back in the 19th century, um, she was saying there is, the, there is a lost continent that went under before Atlantis went under, and it is located somewhere around the sort of interface between the far southwestern Pacific and the Indian Ocean, okay, where Sunderland is, in fact. And, in, and at this point... It's, the research has been done, and it's been determined that the, yeah, the entire, there was this entire continent the size of India, or subcontinent the size of India, okay, that was above water at that time. Which, which was. Nowadays, all, what? It was. Which, it, which yeah. This, this yeah, gets sun, filed sun under ancient or channeled human history. 
Exactly. There was there was a vast amount. There, it was it, as far as they as far as they can tell, it was inhabited. It was probably the place where rice was first domesticated, and all that exists now are the islands of the Philippines, uh, Celebes, Borneo, places like this, which were the mountains back before the waters rose as the as the great ice sheets melted. Um, now, if Plato was right about the time of Atlantis, um, it went under around 9600 BC. Uh, meaning about the end of the uh, Younger Dryas cold snap when sea level jumped very sharply. Sunderland went under around 14,000 B.C., so it was before, it was drowned before the notional, the notional time of the drowning of Atlantis. And there again, you have Blavatsky saying, well, there was Lemuria here, and it drowned before Atlantis sank. It really does sound as though some, some accurate information got um, passed along there somehow. And so some people would, would be able to say that uh, the the two are connected whether it was uh you know a, a common uh you know like a, a common theme or uh, like a common civilization mm-hmm. and you know if you look at easter island where you have the uh, uh moai statues uh mm-hmm. shout out to Grand america um <clears throat> but yeah their their whole logo and I, I know darren and graham were you know we're, we're pretty good friends but and mm-hmm. I, this so, is good i've i've, I've been on no i, I know I've, listen, I li- I've listened to that episode it was fantastic um uh-huh. uh, the idea of the Moai statues uh, being mm-hmm. a below, like below ground once you dig down far enough, uh, and the mm-hmm. ones that are made of basalt specifically were from a region that is currently underwater, and the last time it was mm-hmm. above water was 12, 13,000 years ago. And mm-hmm. all of those Moai statues from 14,000 years ago or 12,000 years ago, and again, that goes back to Robert Schock figuring this out, they have mm-hmm. the idea of the hands which have been wrapped around the navel. And that is the mm-hmm. same, uh, the, the same uh, imagery which is found at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. Mm-hmm. Which is again thirteen, four, like fourteen thousand years ago, and at ten thousand years ago, mm-hmm. it was deliberately buried. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, again, that is the idea of well, okay, well, you're finding two vastly different areas of the planet with the exact same imagery. I'm in advertising and marketing and branding is my specifically my my area of focus, and mm-hmm. which le- leads into the whole idea of of my symbolism research with Freemasonry. Mm-hmm. If you have an exact same the the exact same designs uh, specific like uh, that you've seen in mm-hmm. one area to another and it's it's like not even a theme but the exact same thing they're connected mm-hmm. there's no way in hell that it is not connected mm-hmm. because it is mm-hmm. that same that it, that same um uh, uh, concept is used today to brand McDonald's to brand Starbucks mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. you got a Starbucks cup you know it's from Starbucks uh, mm-hmm. so it's for anybody who says and especially with archaeologists who are like saying like oh there's no correlation I'm like Dude, like, do do you know your shit, or are you completely, like, like what what the hell? Excuse my language. Well, it, he, no, it not just a aggravates me. Not a, no. I, I remember. Not, I, I get this. I remember the comment. Uh, why did they bury those things? It was the first iteration of the ancient housing bubble. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, the with regard to Easter Island, though, you're familiar with the the several wooden boards with writing on them that, yes. ha- that have been discovered there. And are you aware that the, that a script that's apparently identical is known from another location? No, I, no, actually, no, I'm not. Please do describe that. Where this was worth looking into, the Indus Valley Civilization. Oh! Their script, the letters <sighs> or symbols, whatever they are, they look the same. Are you kidding me? Compare them. Seriously, uh, you can find both of them online. Take a look. Check it out. The similarity is stunning. Okay, you, you know, do, do you know Laird Scranton, or have you heard Wait, of what? L- Laird Scranton? He's he's a comparative cosmologist who compares uh, Egypt's, um, uh, like uh, Egypt symbolism and writing to the Dogon, and and uses that to find correlations. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. got it. Yeah, got this got would it. be something right up his alley, and I'm going to talk to him about this afterwards. And get you in touch. I, with I would, him. I would say, have him, have him check it out. It's just, um, this this was actually discussed many many years ago, back in the 1970s, when when um, a lot of <laughs> the last time that this kind of weird idea was widely in circulation, and I was I was into it up to my eyeballs as a kid. Um, somebody somebody just one, one one of the many books in those times about um, you know curiosities of, of unexplainable things in, in archaeology and so on gave several photographs of the Easter Island wooden boards with writings on them, and then showed a whole bunch of um, pictures of seals from um, Mohenjo Daro. Wow. And it really does look like the same script. Well, I, I'm actually, like, writing Laird right now on Facebook while we're talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> so, check him out. I mean, I'm not, I am not an expert, I'm not an expert in um, 
you know, in, in paleography and ancient systems of writing. But certainly based on everything that I could tell, they, they look like, if not exactly the same, then one is very closely related to the other. And, you know, with the, the, there could have been a couple, there could have been a few thousand years of difference. The scripts change a bit over time, as well as over about half the Earth's surface. But, yeah, so you the the thing that I think most people... The, the, let me start that over again, actually, um, with a comment that John Michel, who was a great sacred geometer and a researcher into ley lines and so on, who died a few years back, um, absolutely brilliant man. I wish I'd have had the chance to meet him. Um, but he pointed out that the reason we don't see the remnants of, of the ancient world is that we've lived in the middle of them for so long. We, do, we miss the pattern. Hmm. That it's they're all they're spread out all around us across the landscape, you know, in terms of little oddities like the same script showing up in Eastern Island in Mahendra Daro, or you know the same the hand the hand around the navel thing position showing up in Eastern Island in Gobekli Tepe, um, the very 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 closely related folklore around um, linear landscape alignments in Japan and Britain on the opposite ends of Eurasia. And we just take these things for granted because we, we, we have never learned to step back and see the pattern that connects. Well, I, you know, I, I maintain that uh, after the age of information is the age of reconciliation. So that's the, <laughs> the plight of the modern man is to reconcile all these uh, cross-cultural mm -hmm. references to yeah, yeah, yeah. synthesize that's... something out of it. Yeah, exactly. You know, we, we've, we've turned up all of this, well, you know, we've turned up all this information frankly more than more than any one mind can can handle and so we have a long period of synthesis ahead of eat, us. eat the elephant one day at a time and don't eat it alone <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why we do this I like together that, yeah. yeah that's good that's good now one, one thing i've heard from uh, certain in, there was and again I'm, I'm digging back here like way back into my early days of freemasonry in like 2011 i think uh, mm -hmm. I read this one, uh, uh, this one, uh, I'm going to say like document or, or it was a PDF written by a supposed 33rd degree Freemason out of India, um, who mm -hmm. does, and I'm not much of a proponent of um, like past life regression or mm -hmm. remote viewing. I, again, I don't know one way or another, but I'm just like, yeah, it's a possibility. It's an interesting story. And the idea mm -hmm. of uh, a Freemasonry uh, being a very, very parallel, again, Different symbolism, different words were used as uh, the Abrahamic religions ne weren't necessarily uh, full-blown at that point. Uh, mm -hmm. But the document that was written essentially said that, okay, well, you know, in, back in uh, Egyptian times, uh, Freemasonry mm -hmm. was still prevalent, you know, under different, uh, the sa it was the same ritual, like the same basic floor work, same, same idea, mm -hmm. but using mm -hmm. Egyptian symbolism uh, versus the Talmudic symbolism or, or mm -hmm. Old Testament symbolism. And mm -hmm. there were actually three branches of Freemasonry at that point to, to correspond to the three different uh, pillars, you know, um, uh, strength, beauty, and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And the one that uh, actually survived the ancient times was wisdom, which is the, the Freemasonry style that we uh, practice today. And that came from um, Egypt, was transferred from Egypt uh, by Roman soldiers to Rome, which then also became, uh, which kind of uh, became Mithraism to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you know, you still had the idea of, okay, well, you know, once Christianity became involved, uh, you, you know, it was lost for time. Then let's say, you know, um, uh, you know, you, you have the uh, more scholarly individuals from the medieval times who rediscovered it from their travels all around Europe and all around, uh, uh, you know, Northern Africa and Asia building these temples and picked mm -hmm. up on it and applied the uh, Abrahamic uh, symbolism to it. Mm -hmm. So, is this something that you've you've considered or thought about, or have even run into, or am I like way off the rabbit trail? No, it's it's, it's, it's that's been a, that suggestion has been made for a very long time. Um, let's see, C. W. Leadbeater has a has a book title, I believe, Freemasonry of the Ancient Egyptians. And um, is it true? Heck of a good question. I would love to see I would love to see some evidence, but. Unfortunately, one of the one of the things that has kind of garbled the trail a bit is that there was a while in the 19th and early 20th centuries where Freemasons were very, very eager to find romantic origins for the craft. Uh, partly, I have to say, this was class prejudice because it, in you know in Victorian in the Victorian times it was not 
it was not nice to think of the craft as having started with a bunch of sweaty, um, you know, workmen. That was just very déclassé. And so you had, uh, it was hugely popular to come up with exotic origin stories dating not, back. Not bourgeoisie to, enough, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Very, way too proletarian. Um, actually, that, that, I mean, you get that in the 18th century, too. Um, just this, this, this frantic attempt to come up with a suitably, suitably noble dramatic origin. Um, Ambrose Bierce in the Devil, Devil's Dictionary um, talks about, um, he has a definition of Freemasonry, you know, it's a, this, this craft, this organization founded by unemployed stonemasons in the, in the, you know, the reign of um, George I. Um, they, they had to do something when they weren't working, right? You no, know, so, who su- subsequently recruited members back further through time until at this point, it, ha- it includes everybody this side of Adam and is busy drumming up, um, you know, uh, distinguished recruits among the inhabitants of the pre-creational um, chaos and void. <laughs> so, so, you know, the, the, the snake built the first temple out of the apple, and he bore exactly, into it. Yeah, that, that, you, you, you're, thinking, you're very much along the right lines. Yeah, um, yeah you know, <laughs> there was... And this, it's, it's the same kind of thing that led to the um, led to the creation of the Priory of Zion, with its um, you know its its ancestry dating back uh, six weeks before the dawn of time. Um, it was popular in those days, and unfortunately, there's a lot of undergrowth that has to be pruned out of the uh, from from that period that has to be pruned out of the way and looked at and said, okay, what's the actual evidence? What do what do we know about the origins of Freemasonry? What do we know about other organizations that, and traditions that may have fed into it? We have these various pieces of traditional lore that suggest that um, elements of ancient Egypt, of very late ancient Egyptian tradition, were absorbed into Christian esotericism by various by various means. We have the absorption of, of um, Neoplatonism and some and, and elements of the Greek mysteries, which were absorbed into into Christian practice in certain ways, and are still in, this, in, in the Eastern Orthodox Church are still very much in present. Present, for example, what could have gotten where? And it's complicated, it's been, and not least because so many people seem to have kept their mouths shut while they were doing it. Uh, would you believe that? It- talking about Freemasonry, that the lost secrets or the lost keys or w- w- whatever term that, you know, certain brothers mm-hmm. or brethren or conspiracy theorists would want to uh, divulge mm-hmm. or, you know, to, you know, attach it to, d- mm-hmm. do you think that it's something along the lines of, um, you know, restorative energy? Is it a, a way of taking control of, you know, the powers that uh, kind of make the universe work? Or is it something a lot simpler than that? Well, I think it's it's certainly not about taking control. One of the things that well, this this is our modern this is our modern delusion the notion that you know humanity is the conqueror of nature, man is the measure of all things, the pinnacle of creation. What a bunch of pompous crap! Okay, um, the universe was not created for man. The universe was not created for man, and we, we almost got you to swear again too. We just happened to be here. You, 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 <laughs> Um, we're here for whatever reason, whether we happen to be here, whether, you know, um, if, if, you, if you're a religious person and believe we were created, so was everything else. I mean, so we're, uh, so we're skunk cabbages. Everything was created. Everything was created with a purpose and a place. And when we put on airs and start insisting that we are the, you know, we are the big cheese of the cosmos, we're just being stupid. And so it may be that the lost word that the lost keys of Freemasonry has to do with some mode of participation in the energies that, that bring that create and sustain the cosmos. Not of control over them, but participating in them. It may be that it's something else, something simpler, something more complex. We simply don't know. And half the fun to me is realizing that we are, you know, as as we as we as so many other Masons have done, as we seek the lost word, as we try to find the law, the true secrets of a Master Mason. Um we're really comprehensively in the dark. We have no idea what we might find. I've offered my, my hypothesis as to what, the, what the, the, the true secrets of Master Mason might have been, that they might have been this ancient temple technology that was used to bring, bring abundance and fertility to ancient societies. Um, do I know for a fact that that's the case? No, I don't. As I say, it's a hypothesis. 
It's my best guess based on the information that I've gathered. And if it turns out to be true, I will be, I, I, I will be delighted, and, and it would be really interesting to see that put back to work. Um, if it turns out to be something else, it'll be, wow, I didn't expect that. So what's not to love? And do you think that the, uh, you know, like the, the Knights Templar, uh, do you think mm-hmm. that they kind of rediscovered this, uh, the, mm-hmm. this type of technology? That's, you see, that's, that's one of the basic elements of my, of my thesis, that the Knights Templar, in some way, by some connection, in the Holy Land, learned about this technology. Now, one of the things to remember about the Middle East, then as now, is that it is full of little obscure religious groups that have their own secret traditions that they generally don't talk about much, for, for very good reason. I mean, whoever, whoever owns the, whoever's owned the Middle East since, um, well, really since, since um, the Christianization of the Roman Empire, whoever's owned the Middle East, they've had their religion, and you had better not argue with it, or they will you know, put you to death. And that's been true of Christians, it's been true of Muslims, it's been true of everybody. And so, yeah, you have a lot of these little groups. You have the Mendeans, you have, you have the Sabians, you have all of these, and they all have their own little traditions. My thesis is that, based on some elements in the Grail legends and some elements in what we know about the Knights Templar, is that the Templars ended up in contact with a group, uh, a group descended from one of the currents of Gnosticism, um, from, the, um, from the Nassim Gnostics, who were rather different from the sort of world-hating... The um, Nassim you know, or the Essene? Nothing. N a a s s e n e. So not 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 the Gnostics who believe that mm. uh, you know the God is some evil entity that is here yeah, to yeah, steal souls. Yeah, exactly. And... Yeah, okay. Exactly. Not 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 the Gnostics who believe that the world was the creation of the devil and we're all trapped here and have to find the escape hatch. No, the Nassins. If if you have a chance, um, Jesse Weston's book um, uh, from Ritual to Romance, which is a study of the Grail legend. And she argues that, the, that one of the things at the root of the Grail legend is a set of initiation rituals. Oh. Huh. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And the, yeah. And that these rituals probably came out of Nazi Gnosticism. And she provides, she, it's, it's a really fascinating book. And so that's, that was one of the things that I very, I very strongly relied on in here is because she draws, I think, a very strong, a very, makes a very strong case. But my take is that, because the Nazis believe they were the real Christians, that they really understood what Jesus was about and so on. But they also, they had, unlike so many Christian groups, they argued that the old pagans were also doing something valid, that Christianity was, in, was something in addition to, something that completed and fulfilled paganism, not that overthrew it. So they were totally cool about the old pagan mystery initiations. And so the Nazis had absorbed this. So the, the thesis was that there were some of, these, some of these folks still around in the Holy Land when the Crusaders showed up. And that the Templars ended up interacting with them, and at least some of the Templars were going, "Okay, you're right. You've got a more, you've got a, a, a true and deeper form of Christianity than the one we're used to." And that that was the Templar secret, that they became sort of covert Nazis, and that in the process, whether through the Nazis or through something else, they also got a hold of the Temple tradition, and that's what they brought back to Europe, and that's what Scottish Templars. Um, immediately after the after the the dissolution of the Templar Order, um, when some of the when you know some Scottish Templars who had that who were in who were into that got involved in the building trades, passed that on to early operative Masons, who passed it on to the spec who passed on what they knew to the speculative Masons. But that's where the knowledge was that there was a secret. Well, this also goes to the idea that there are Scottish free like I, I think before the main. Um, you know, the, the Grand Lodge, like the first Grand Lodge of mm-hmm. England was formed. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the original people who were who was there at that meeting during during, during the forming uh, originally mm-hmm. had gone to Scotland in oh, yeah. um, in New Ed- or in Edinburgh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And he actually yeah. came upon a Scottish Masonic Lodge that had basically oh. like, a, you know, very similar to what we were, were talking, uh, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. what we deal with right now today. And mm-hmm. was initiated into those mysteries, and then brought that back to uh, to England. Oh yeah. So yeah, no, the, the the Scottish the Scottish lodges um, lodges in Edinburgh and several other ones actually go go back well before 1717. And in fact, there are there are um, let's see, David Stevenson's book, um, the history, the origins of Freemasonry, Scotland Century, 
talks about the, the way that the transition from operative to speculative masonry basically happened in Scotland. And it was after that that, yeah, various people were initiated into as speculative masons in Scotland, and then gradually it permeated south, and then you had the four lodges in London um, that met together and, um, and formed the first Grand Lodge. And now, have you heard of uh, um, uh, Tristan Bordelard's um, uh, new movie, Terra Masonica? Have you uh, heard no, of it? No, I haven't heard a thing about it. This okay. Time. Well, there, there's a movie uh, t- coming out, which uh, all the Freemasons here in Ottawa are just going absolutely apeshit over, and I love it, uh, <laughs> called Terra Masonica. It's around the world mm-hmm. in 80 lodges. Um, and wow. Yeah, it, it's, it's being released in February. We actually have one on the show in two weeks. Uh, mm-hmm. So... Uh, Apparently, like he goes through the eighty lodges, like uh, like he goes to India, he goes to the southern United States. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the man, the man's a um, uh, you know like a multiple award winning photographer and mm-hmm. uh, and a, a movie maker. Mm-hmm. But he also uh, produces one movie, the Solomon Key, or the Scottish mm-hmm. Key rather, which essentially mm-hmm. talks about the original forming of the lodge, uh, the lodges, mm-hmm. and he goes into the entire oh you know the the, the entire uh, concept of. Okay, well, was it, uh, you know, people say that England was the first Grand Lodge, and that's the origins of Freemasonry in the, the 1700s, but it's like, but there are these Scottish lodges that go back to the 1500s, and there, here's the minutes. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So uh, the, the idea that, that Freemasonry is only 300 years old, like in its current form as far as the United Grand Lodge of England, which I know mm-hmm. was the American system before the 1800s, like uh, uh, mid-1800s before the... Uh, I forget the name of the event, but you know there, there was a, a massive Masonic backlash there at that time. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So the uh, Morgan affair, yeah, yeah. So the, like you know the the entire um, uh, you know the entire ritual in the U.S. changed, but it still contained the same symbolism. And mm-hmm. that idea that you know Freemasonry, even though we say okay, well you know the United States in, in 300 years from now, people in the states will be like, oh well, Freemasonry you know, started here in the United States and uh, such and such a date. And you know there there are there <laughs> yeah. are tales that it was in England in 1700s. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So, so like, uh, well, yeah. The the major difference, the the thing that happened in 1717 that sets it apart was the first Grand Lodge. Now you'll notice the four lodges that founded that Grand Lodge had been in London, according to the record of the time, since time immemorial. Hmm. So Freemasonry did not begin in 1717. The only thing that began in 1717 was a, was the habit of having Grand Lodges. I figured if it started in 1717, then the secret lost word was Dererum Natura, which is a heretical work that... Uh, mm-hmm. Which is like, yeah. for hand me that scotch? No, no, the, the, the nature of no, things. No, that was... A, yeah, that was no. That, you're thinking of Lucretius. Yeah. yeah, no, no. Hand me, hand me that scotch. <laughs> that, that's that. That was that's the password of the fourth degree up in up in mm. Edinburgh. <laughs> Illuminati confirmed. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure our Scottish brethren got uh, got very thoroughly illuminated. <laughs> oh. Well, it's, it's it's like that uh, that uh, that Family Guy episode. And there, there's this one skit where it's like, th- this is like a, th- Peter's taking his uh, his son to uh, you know this this uh, hi- their history of of his family and like okay well, you have to learn about your Irish history, and it goes through like you know the. Uh, you know, 1700s, where you know, like the tradition of uh, Catholic families producing a lot of children, and it's like, okay, well, this is what we believe uh, Irish, you know, Ireland was like in the old times, and it's like some futuristic Jetsons world, until like you know, it's a bunch of scientists getting around. It's like, like, wow, we're we, we just found a way to convert our entire population to energy, and it's like, oh shit, Seamus just like discovered how to be able to create this one drink. He calls it whiskey, and it's like the entire civilization crashes just from that. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but le- le- levity aside, the... Levity uh, is fine. Uh, <laughs> furthermore, I, I, th- I think I'd rather have the whiskey. <laughs> oh, don't do you. You're telling me it's the entire foundation of the show. <laughs> let, let the world burn and drink it in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fiat whiskey, Ruat <laughs> Kaidon. <laughs> Uh, like now, again, I'm going to segue in, into the the coming of the wasteland, and, and we're, you know we're we're coming near near the end of the episode. Uh, mm-hmm. And speaking of uh, you know the end of civilization at the cause of whiskey, I don't I'm, I'm sure that whiskey and scotch was not the cause of land going into ruin. 
Um, no. But what what was your what what is your take on that? How uh, okay? There's it, it is a very interesting fact that when um, end of the Middle Ages transition into what historians clumsily call the early modern period. Um, over much of Europe, the, old, the, the, the monasteries, which under my theory had, had managed to preserve much of this ancient technology, were abolished. I, well, actually, they were abolished in all the Protestant countries. In the Catholic countries, they were put under new strict supervision. They had to follow an approved ritual um, handed down from Rome and had people breathing down their necks all the time. So there were probably things, there would have been things they traditionally did they could not do anymore. And all of a sudden, you have famine, you have um, large sections of... There, there are whole regions in England right now, okay, that in the Middle Ages had um, villages all over them. Villages, farmland, they were bustling, lots of people. Um, and then, you know, and that's true of, uh, as late as 1500, and then you get to like 1650, 1700... There's nobody there. There's never been a, a settling, settlement there since. It's high. It's you know high blasted, wind blasted kind of thing where you can barely you can barely raise sheep. It used to be that scientists insisted that the 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 late medieval there was a there was an early medieval actually in the early medieval warm period before what's called the, the little ice age, and that it was sufficient. It was it was uh, seriously warmer than it is today, and that's why. For example, you had wine grapes being grown over much of southern England, which you can't do anymore. Yeah, I, I, I know. Uh, Randall Carlson actually has mentioned the exact same thing. I have to hook exactly. you guys up. Like, now, here's the thing. The latest studies of temperature from like Greenland ice cores and so on, there was no early medieval warm period. I mean, it was better than it was warmer than the little the, the little ice age that follows, but it was actually no warmer than it, than it was before global warming started kicking in a few years back. So how come you had all of these areas that were produ- that were productive farms that you can't grow anything on today? My thesis is that this is again the collapse of the old temple technology, which was making it possible to grow crops in areas which don't support crops now. Interestingly, the same thing happened when the Roman Empire went Christian. When, when Christianity was imposed over the Roman Empire, very large sections of the empire had immense population drops over the century or two that followed. And you had just, there was no food to be had. Um, made one of the major differences, north of the Mediterranean, south of the Mediterranean. North of the Mediterranean, you have Christianity, which ended up adopting a version of the temple technology a little later on, during the Dark Ages. South of the Mediterranean, you've got Islam, and they have been absent. They do not. A mosque is not a temple. A mosque is a place where you listen to, you know, you, you, you listen to readings of the Quran and pray to Allah, and they don't do any of the temple technology. So even though the north of the Mediterranean and south of the Mediterranean have essentially the same climate, north of the Mediterranean, you know, Spain, southern France, Italy, are green. South of the Mediterranean, it's desert. I, I guess you could, you could say, well, where does it... Uh... Where's, I'm trying to think of the metaphor here. Where where does the metal meet the road or something? That's the yeah, metaphor. Ex- but exactly. It, you know, where well, you've got a, a rising yeah. rising trend in the prevalence of agriculture, sustaining mm-hmm. society, and people's ability to maintain and control uh-huh. agriculture. And then you have all these buildings being built as yeah. a correlation. But then you say, well, okay, so in terms of the volume of agriculture and the volume of buildings that are both increasing and trending lines, you'd say, well, Mm -hmm. how does this temple showing Mm -hmm. increased yields on the, you'd say, well, am I getting heavier grapes? (laughs) The grapes that are growing near the church? Well, look at at ancient Egypt. Getting back Mm -hmm. to the... Like ancient Egypt during Zeptepi during uh, like around 10,000 years ago, up until about like Mm -hmm. uh, six or 7,000 years ago, the Sahara was fertile, you know, like mm-hmm. rainforest. It, it was. It was. It, well, it was, it was savanna. savanna. They, yeah, it, it was savanna. They had they had gazelles. They had giraffes. They had lions, um, and then the rain stopped coming. That was actually the, the first thing. The the, the 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 deep Sahara, yeah, dried out. Now here's the thing: until the end of the Roman Empire, North Africa was a major grain belt. What's now Morocco, Tunisia, Libya produced huge amounts of grain. That was where the grain came, the grain ships loaded to take grain to Rome, which had like a million and a half people. Okay? You can't grow hardly anything there anymore. What happened? 
I'm arguing that that the reason that they were able to that they were able to turn that area into a grain belt was because of the temple technology, because um, versions of the temple of the temple technology from Egypt and then also as reworked by the Greeks had spread all over what northern Africa, all over the, the the southern Mediterranean coast. They were they were doing the temple technology hardcore, and they got the results. That is to say, bumper crops of wheat and and other agricultural products when. Christianity came through and tore down the temples and put up churches, and then Islam came through and tore down the churches and put up mosques. The temple technology fell into fell into disuse, and agricultural fertility dropped through the floor. Populations plunge, and you end up with the de- with the mostly desert countries that we have now. Um, and you know you can say, well, yeah, there could have been other causes. Of course, there could have been other causes, but look at north of the Mediterranean. Um, again, Spain. Have you, have you ever heard of the idea of uh, Haran's fountain, which is uh, it's like first century AD, where they started doing hydraulics with waters to open like megalithic church doors and things like that? Oh yeah, yeah. Where they were like they were yeah. playing with water tables and displacement. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the, the, yeah. I mean, the, the the stuff that was going on around right around the beginning in the beginning of the Common Era, they had some amazingly complicated stuff. The Romans used to build used to do um, an, an organ using a hydraulic organ. That, yeah, that's music, the really music. cool stuff. Like you light this torch and it heats up this water, and then you know, yeah, oh, yeah, minutes yeah, later oh, yeah, the door of, to this you know, giant yeah, church of opens. Alexandria. Yeah, yeah. You light the, you light the incense on the altar, and the shrine door comes open. The statue of the god comes out. Yeah, yeah. yeah that that like that uh, particular uh, architect was basically known. Mm-hmm. That was his thing. That's how he made his money. It's like, oh, we want mm-hmm. we, we want to be able to impress the people. Hire this guy, and he will make yeah, some. Yeah, like, send send a hero. Yeah, very, very impressive yeah. temples. Yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the guy who came who came up with, as far as we know, the world's first steam turbine. And that was like you know, three thousand years before we even yeah, had exactly. knowingly uh-huh. uh, steam technology, which I I think is like phenomenal. Like how how do, how did we go three thousand years? In, in discovering this, it's, it's like Greek fire and napalm. Like there's a large disparity of thousands of years between the technology mm-hmm. first being used and then mm-hmm. it being rediscovered and, and mass produced. Yeah, okay. and then it gets then it gets lost, and because if and, you, and this is this if is you had water pumps back then, you, your agriculture would be next level. Exactly, and and they were using water pumping techniques to get water into the into the field through the rain. They, they were doing all kinds of stuff. Um, one of the interesting things, I, um, some years ago, I translated a um, an Arab. Um, well, it was, it was from Latin. The, the Latin translation, the Latin medieval Latin version of an Arabic textbook on sorcery and the picatrix. Um, if you th- everything you 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 know about the Necronomicon, the the imaginary book of magic that H.P. Lovecraft cooked up. Um, it's it's basically true about the Picatrix. Um, apparently, Lovecraft didn't know about the Picatrix, but I, but he invented it anyway. Uh, but anyway, it includes a lot of material on agriculture. That's hmm. interesting. Why why would that, that, that why would you do that? Well, because the thing is, a, a wizard, your your common or garden variety wizard in the Dark Ages, was an all purpose intellectual. Um, the Picatrix actually lists lists the things that you needed to know to be an effective sorcerer, and you know, you need to have a good grasp of politics and economics and military science and um, mathematics and all this kind of stuff because you're going to be advising people. What about if the giant lucky, floppy be, hat? Is, was that necessary? Yeah, exactly. As well? Yeah, you, I love... you, you need you need you need the tall hat with the moon <laughs> stars. That's advertising, okay? But if you're lucky, you're going to be at, you're going to be advising kings. You have to give them good advice, uh, uh, and the number one thing that you have to make sure of. To make sure your ki- the kingdom the king and the kingdom prosper is make sure their agriculture works. The food has to keep ah. growing, or everybody or everything blows up in your face. And there you go. The basis for society yeah, exactly. is agriculture. So you know your 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 basic, your basic Gandalf type the is functioning as an currency. all-purpose intellectual consultant. <clears throat> <laughs> Weeds, the, you shall not grow. Th- there's a great McKenna quote where he's talking about. Um, your average person is running, uh, he's drawing a comparison uh, for culture as an operating system. Is the YouTube video, and he's saying your, your average person is running you know, culture light, whereas uh, <laughs> your shamans are running the full registered <laughs> developers mm-hmm. edition of the software. You know, the, the, the cracked edition that they haven't actually paid for, and they just replace mm-hmm. a few files or run a key gen. It's like, oh, okay, there we go, we got crops. It's a beautiful modern parallel. <laughs> <laughs> Now, how how have people been able to recover this technology o- over time, and like even if it's been lost, 
that like is it something that has been passed down like what we've we've talked about the free ma- like the old uh, operative masons guilds where mm-hmm. the knowledge on how to be able to build a cathedral from a master mm-hmm. builder to a you know fellow craft to to an apprentice was passed down is mm-hmm. is this how the technology has been like lost and found like what happens if there's a break in the chain you see that's just, that's that's the problem that we face here because i'm arguing that there was a break in the chain between um probably between about 1500 and about 1700 that was an era of savage civil wars across britain and, and most of europe in fact and it would have been very difficult to keep that kind of oral tradition intact and i'm arguing that in fact the chain was broken at that point and that's why what we have are the intriguing but inconclusive fragments if the tradition has survived intact at all um it will survive it will be in um possibly in india possibly in japan both of those areas have had the cultural continuity although there's been a lot of disruption there too um the other possibility is that there may be documentary sources but it is it is not something as you know as far as we know the lost word remains lost but it might be it's possible that it could be found again and what I what I suggest is that there's there's several different angles that could be taken to try to find it because the one the one great advantage we have here is that we know that this system was not come up with using really expensive technologies. It was come up with over you know by trial and error through people who were noticing that certain kinds of buildings had certain effects on the surrounding fields. And so on the one hand, there's the research and documentary sources in the, the traditions of other cultures correlating all this body of knowledge together until maybe it, it becomes complete enough that we can look at it all and say, okay, this makes sense. That might be how it works. This is... The other end of it is experimentation, um, whether on the part of um, clergy in existing religious traditions who might have access, might have the opportunity to test it out in a straightforward way, or, you know, people who have the opportunity to put up a, you know, like one of these small rural shrines that were commonly used all over the ancient world are still in use in Japan today. And, you know, again, do the experiment. Find out what works. Test it out. If I had the funding, I, I, I'd be very interested in putting up a temple somewhere. Now, also, speak, I, speaking of experiments, and again, just to be able to kind of like, you mm-hmm. know, Jo- playfully plug the book again. There, there are actually experiments that you uh, put as a side table to mm-hmm. uh, two people to try out for themselves, which I find is fantastic. Yeah. It's like an interactive, uh, like okay, like here's all this knowledge. Try it out for yourselves at home, kids. And I think yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Check, check this puppy out. And so, yeah, that that was I got I got that one from from um, a book by Dr. Philip Callahan. He he's one of the people who noticed that the um, paramagnetic stone. We, I mentioned that briefly. I will move since we are fairly close to the end. I'll just summarize here. Most substances in nature are either paramagnetic or diamagnetic. Paramagnetic stones have very weak magnetism; they kind of attract magnetic fields. Diamagnetic substances repel magnetism very slightly. Again, you you basically need an instrument to detect this, but it's but is known which is which. Strongly paramagnetic stone is generally used for um, temples. It's standing stones. The kind of standing stones that are used to, um, like in, you find, yeah, you know, they're almost all made of very strongly paramagnetic stone. And so, my the the thesis is this is part of the puzzle. Um, what part of the puzzle? We we don't know. That's again, we this is this is very much like the old quest for the Holy Grail. You saddle up and climb on your horse and. Grab your sword and your shield and start writing and see what you find. This is why we're heading out to do an excursion to Mount Sarabit. Yeah. You know, if you if you want to pay for that trip to, a trip to Egypt, go for it. Or, you know, <laughs> you you can support the show uh, in the notes below and send us some, you know, send us some support dollars to get us out to Egypt. We'll, we will podcast from the Middle East if uh, things go well, I, I hope. Okay. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like that that's absolutely fantastic. I, I think we've like summarized the spirit of the new book and honestly I would recommend all of our listeners go check it out. I've I've read it over the last couple of days. Um uh, you know, I, I read the first half uh like at least one, one, once I've uh, I got my my version from uh, from Sarah and it just captivated me. I, I powered through you know, as much as I could today, you know, dealing with the accident and all that, but it just mm-hmm. was so interesting, so chock full of knowledge, and well, answered so many questions that I've had talking from other guests, and like it's it's completing the puzzle, and and it's, that's the one extra piece. It's like okay, you've got uh, you know the the corner piece that 
all of a sudden you've got like 15 other pieces that you've had on the side that you you can start placing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all of a sudden click, 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 click. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So like, mm-hmm. like I, I'm absolutely mind blown uh, by by the book and, and what we've discussed tonight. Uh, before we end, and I know that we wanted to be able to talk, to talk about this, uh, was, you know, like you are a, uh, like you're currently a Grand Arch Druid, you're also a Freemason. Actually, actually, I'm, I'm, actually I'm, I'm a, the, the bio you got was a little, was about a year out of date. I retired as Grand Arch Druid in, um, at the winter solstice of 2015. I am now a, an Arch Druid Emeritus and um, rather enjoying having a little more spare time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I well, I was a senior warden in my lodge before I was going to be, becoming a master. So I, you know, mm-hmm. apparently from what I was told, it's like, you know, the masters, you know, like the the grand arch druid, the master of the lodge. It's kind of the same idea. You're heading up an organization, and the mm-hmm. idea of free time from people I know that have been, let's say, in yeah. the master's chair for two, three years, you know, <laughs> yeah. concurrently, they're like, uh, like, it's like I'm ready to, I'm, I'm ready to sleep now. <laughs> 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 so how how did yeah. you, like. You you have you've you've talked a lot of, uh, in uh, a lot about on the internet for most podcasts. I've heard the collapse of civilization podcasts, mm-hmm. the recurring theme of peak oil. That was a big mm-hmm. theme for you for a long time. I think this is actually the first mm-hmm. podcast you've talked about the the lost mm-hmm. keys of Freemasonry or, or Freemasonry in general. Which mm-hmm. I'm I'm I, I feel very privileged to have you talking about it. But how did you get involved in Freemasonry in the first place? Um, it's kind of a complicated story. I um originally. When, when I, uh, as, as you mentioned in the bio, um, way back when we, uh, at the opening, I grew up in a non-religious household. I had, I always had the idea, though there was, there was definitely something out there, something very interesting. And um, like a lot of a lot of young people in the in the late 1970s, I explored, you know, a little bit of, it, of Eastern religion, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But I found, I really found my spiritual home in the Western esoteric traditions. And part of the way that worked out was that I got I got involved in the Golden Dawn tradition of ceremonial magic. Holy and, shit! Excuse my yeah. language. That is awesome. No, no, the, no. The gold. They, it was most of what you could get. I mean, you could get a lot of, of Wicca in those days, kind of the Wicca light, and that did not interest me um, for a variety of reasons. But the Golden Dawn was of great interest. It was, you know, it was it was old fashioned. It was stuffy. It was stodgy. It involved lots of memorization and complicated stuff. So I loved it, of course. And so I spent I spent about twenty years studying, uh, doing systematic work in the Golden Dawn tradition, just training myself. Um, I didn't have access to uh, to a temple at that time or anything like that. Uh, it was just solo study based on the published material, and there were all these things that just didn't quite mesh. And then in let's see, it would have been 1993. I inherited a ceremonial sword that my grandfather had owned. Actually, my great grandfather had owned. My, my grandfather had it, and it it, belong, it was a ceremonial sword for the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, which he had belonged to. Oh. And I had gone the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, and it so happened that uh, my wife, um, when we were talking about that, and she said, "Yeah, they actually have a lodge here in Seattle. You know, they they just there was an article in the paper the other day." So I put in I put in a petition to the local lodge, the Independent Order of Lodge Fellows, and I was and, and was accepted for membership. And I was about ten minutes into the initi the initiatory degree, the first of the initiations of the Odd Fellows, and was going, "Holy crap! I know what's going on here. The ritual is not the same, but the overall structure. This is what they were talking about in the Golden Dawn. This is how the initiation rituals work. Okay." So I was inv- I was heavily involved in the Odd Fellows for some time, and I had a I had a lodge brother who was a, who was a brother Mason, and as well as an Odd Fellow, and I, we we got to talking, and I ended up saying you know deciding to to try Masonry as well, and because of course the founders of the Golden Dawn were Masons up to their eyeballs, William Wynne Westcott, who was one of the two main founders, was also the founder of Quattro Coronati, one of the founders of Quattro Coronati Lodge of Research in London. Um, and he involved. He had a finger in every Masonic pie in in in, in Britain and, and and large parts of Western Europe. And so you know, so I got involved. So that 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 was what got me involved in Masonry. That um, you know, the Golden Dawn connection, the desire to have to have access to the tradition that it shaped. He was one of those guys this, who hasn't paid for dinner since like 1983. <laughs> um. 
No, because most of the lodges I belong to, the you, the, you know, you need to chip in a little bit. We're not that wealthy. Well, <laughs> or or, or eating, eating dinner at home since nineteen eighty three. I think that's the no. I, I for, fortunately, <laughs> I, I would, I would, I, I would. There, there would, there would not be domestic felicity if I were to, um, <clears throat> to attend lodge too many nights a week. But, um, but I have, I have eaten a lot of lodge food, and yeah. So that that was that was what. So I, I, I joined um, the the same lodge that my lodge brother belonged to, and um, the Doric Number 92 in Seattle, Washington, and proceeded from there. And you're also, like, I'm involved in the Scottish uh, Scottish Rite, and one of mm-hmm. my selling things to kind of, like, give myself a little bit of credibility to, uh, you know, whether to scare the crap out of the conspiracy theorists to not listen to the show because we don't do conspiracy theories on the show, or get the mm-hmm. people who really love the ancient history. I do mention that I'm a 32nd degree Freemason at every mm-hmm. single turn that I can, and I know that you're 32nd as well in the southern jurisdiction. That's correct. So how... Uh, 30, 32nd degree KCCH, Knight Commander of the Court of Honor, which is kind of the halfway mark between uh, 32nd and 33rd in, in the Southern Jurisdiction. Oh, okay. Well, we, don't, we, we pretty much just jump from the 32nd, which is the... Uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Prince of the Royal Secret, and then it just Prince goes, Secret, yeah. and it just jumps into the thirty third as as an honorary degree. Which you know, it, yeah. it's like we, we've had individuals who who have donated donated their time to the Scottish Rite just to be able to put on the allegorical plays on a weekly basis, and mm-hmm. or they've they've uh, given to the community a lot, and they they're given they're mm-hmm. uh, accorded that degree. So, um, yeah. I, I know it works. Yeah, and, yeah, in the, in the southern jurisdictions, it's done the same way. But there's basically there's there's this sort of intermediate thing where if you do a lot of work within uh, within the craft or within the community or so on, you can be honored with the you go from the black the black hat of the thirty thirty second degree to a red hat. Wow. Okay. And then yeah, and then it is from among the red hats that um, the the few and the the few and extra and the really committed. Now we're getting into received. some strange operating systems, literally. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, then Red they hat. end up getting uh, receiving receiving the thirty third degree and get and get the white hat. Uh, now you're also part of the York Rite. I'm also part of the York Rite. I am. Yeah, I am a um, a companion of the Holy Royal Arch. I am um, a um, cryptic mason. I am a Knight Templar. And um, I'm actually currently, as a as a result, I've, I've been I've been command I've been the presiding officer in all three of those bodies. And uh, one question is, why haven't you joined the Trine yet? Is it the small cars? <laughs> are are you too tall for that? Uh, well, actually, I've, partly I've been kind of saving that. Partly the the where I where I currently live, um, I don't drive. Okay, and that's, that's partly, save, save the best that's for last. Partly be, that's partly that's largely because you would not want. Um, I, I I don't have good eye hand coordination, and I tend to get very distracted by my thoughts. You do not want me at the, under under control of half a ton of methylene plastic rattling down the road. But <laughs> or, I don't or a plane with a giant, like a small plane with a propeller, you know, spinning in the no, breeze with no, a no, with no, a clown no, hat just, on. Just, no, no, no. Of course no, not. No, no. But the thing is, the the local shrine is is just is difficult for me to get to. Okay, well, you know, like that's it's a long. It'd be a long walk, and so um, eventually that will. I, I, I may, I may, um, you know, petition for a shrine membership at some point. We'll see what happens. But at the moment, at the moment, my my Masonic plate is fairly full. Well, yeah, I gotta understand that. I'm I'm still I'm working on the the the, the work for the thirty second degree mm-hmm. allegory starts. Uh, the practice for it starts now. Essentially, mm-hmm. it's like okay, here's your part. Start start learning. And I'm actually uh, yeah. I'm, I'm actually a flag bearer. I'm, I'm working up the office, uh, officership in the consistory right now, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like f- for me, it the the, the memorization is a, a lot easier I find because it's a lot more conversational than than you know you're, instead of giving like a mm-hmm. ten page speech in the Blue Lodge mm-hmm. here in here in Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think it's all good fun because it's like you're in a room of you know all these old you know these thirty third degree Freemasons who have been in the craft for thirty forty years. And you're like, mm-hmm. okay, like I'm going to give it my all, my gusto, and then you hear mm-hmm. yourself through the sound system that they have with this little microphone that's hanging over your head, and you're like, you know, okay, you know, like, do I really sound like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're um, my my Royal Arch chapter right now is gearing up to put on the Mark Mason degree, and I will be the I will be the um, venerable master in that. Or whatever, which I'm losing track of the of the various terms. I'll have to look it up. But I, I'm the I'm the presiding officer for that degree, and so I have I, I need to refresh my memory on all the things that I get to say. But it's it's good fun stuff. Oh, that's the whole point. Uh, with uh, Alex, is there anything you wanted to add from a 
uh, mystery school, Freemason. M- you, uh, I, I well, I was gonna ask about the the temp or the um, parallel between the Kabbalistic uh, Tree of Life pillars and the Jacob and Boaz pillars of mm-hmm. the temples for Solomon. But there was uh, something mm-hmm. I had a question in there. Yeah. very very likely. Um, I mean, the, according according to all our available records, the the Temple of Solomon had the two, had the two big brass pillars standing out in front of it, and as part of the and that was that was actually very common for tem, for temples at that place and time. If you go to the other little kingdoms scattered around that end of the Middle East, you would find other temples with two pillars out in front, and based on the Egyptian the Egyptian habit of having pylons, and um, so. Very likely, on the one hand, you know that that would have been adopted into Freemasonry along with everything else from Solomon's Temple that wasn't nailed down, and of course the Jew, the Jewish um, rabbis who created the Kabbalah had all of this Talmudic lore in mind. They were thinking of Solomon's Temple all the time too, and so the pillars came naturally to mind. Of course, they make a very good symbolic representation of of the duality's existence. And you know when you stand between them in one context or another, you are you're resolving that binary into a into a ternary. We have a long talk about the sometime about the uh, the the numerical logic of twos and threes and how that fits into symbolism of the tree of life and all kinds of other things like that. But yeah, it's all it it is all connected. <clears throat> and speaking of all connected. Uh, you know, I, I think at least because you know, I know that you're in the eastern eastern uh, time zone. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of our guests they're in the central or uh, out west, so they're you know for them it's like three or two hours uh, behind. We're we're, we're coming mm-hmm. on to midnight. I know that you need to be able to get some rest because you probably have some uh, you know some memory work to work on with the Mark Masters oh, yeah, degree have, coming up. I, I have some stuff to write. What so. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I wanted to thank you very much for, for coming on the show. Um, it, but I'm go, I'm going to play the outro music for you, which we do for every single guest. It's uh, uh, from a, uh, a group called uh, Broke for Free. It's called Spellbound, uh, keeping with the mm-hmm. our intro music, which is mm-hmm. only knows. Yeah, you, know, you, you got to keep that knowledge going. But if you could mm-hmm. stay on the line after the uh, track Not is a done, at all. just just for a brief moment, just because I, I, I want to get some information from you quickly before we uh, disconnect. Uh, yes. But uh, I'll. We want information. You won't get it. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> well, you know, with 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 the right words and, and enough whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we're not gonna argue. Truth serum, Glenn <laughs> Fittich. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this this is spell brown, uh, spellbound. Excuse me. From broke for free, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for listening to the program. Uh, Alex, uh, did you want to say goodbye? Good evening, everyone. Oh, thank you for tuning in. God, I love your voice and, so much. And thank you to everyone also. <laughs> uh, next week, which is going to be on Thursday at 11 a.m., uh, let me just get my calendar out here. I should have had this ready beforehand. Come on. Come on. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, John Michael Greer, brother John Michael Greer, talking about the lost keys of Freemasonry. Um, we are Friday... Just January 20th, 2017. Uh, next week, the 26th of January, we have international recording artist and uh, DJ and performer Max Graham on for a special 11 a.m. show to talk about Cycles of Music and his uh, new release, uh, Cycles 8. Uh, that he's he's been my inspiration for for DJing for the last like 15 years. Honestly, uh, you're you're gonna love this show. Don't catch it. Uh, don't miss it, I should say. Uh, catch it like the cold. <laughs> we'll see you online and uh, check out info at dentalfloor dot uh, uh, to send me an email about the uh, new. Send us. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> send us email with all of your questions, comments. Okay. Questions, comments. Uh, send us some scotch if need be by electronic means if necessary. <laughs> And uh, also, don't forget to check out uh, the new book by John Michael Greer, Secrets of the Temple, on Amazon.com. The link is in the show notes. Uh, Buy a copy for your dog if you love this uh, program. Send some love his way. 
And uh, yeah, right now it's got like a five star rating on Amazon. I love the book. I'm going to put my own review up today or tomorrow morning when I wake up with a little bit of a hangover, but still. Join us next week. Same den time, <laughs> same den channel. And uh, you know, keep your scotch in a decanter. Just make sure it's not leaded. Crystal. Glass is perfect. Sure. Choose your scotch tip for the evening. Good night, everybody.